So Lindsay and I had an exam yesterday. So uh, this will, uh, for better or worse, all our exams seem to be lining up. So we obviously haven't had time to make <laughs> slides or anything. Um, but what we'll do is we'll go through a little, um, we'll go, I'll go through the pulmonary stuff. Lindsay's going to cover the heme and all the blood cancers and um, we'll go from there. So um, I guess we should go ahead and get started. Um, let's see. So, uh, let me show my screen. That would help. So, if it makes you guys feel better, after this exam, I found that the next module, that six week module, was a lot of review. So I know some of the cardio stuff was, and uh, all those drugs and stuff were new. And uh, these drugs are new too. I thought that the last module was a good bit of review. So um, if you could just get over this hump Monday, uh, you should be good to go to finish the term out strong. I know it's, uh, you feel a little burned out towards the end uh, for sure. So just keep that in mind as you go forward, just in case anybody's new, if you go to scrubs, the video will be recorded. The link, yeah, these videos are private. So the link is here. You can click that. Uh, it'll bring you here. I'll post it after the review is done. Um, just bookmark this page and then you, uh, you have it. It won't be a problem. As always, this is not affiliated with IEA, but you should follow IEA. We put questions of the day and um, we're still offering tutoring. So um, uh, we will do that through the end of the month. So if you're interested in that, go for it. Okay. So we'll start with a little talk with some of the stuff that I found a bit confusing uh, with the pulmonary stuff. All right. So if you remember from whenever you did renal, um, renal um, pulmonary the first time, term one. So we, we basically break things down into obstructive versus restrictive, right? So COPDs are obstructive and all those, um, you know, those um, irritating diseases that, you know, uh, asbestosis or any sort of autoimmune disease, those tend to be those restrictive or fibrotic diseases. So there are a couple of things um, to get into there, but what I want to talk about first is this idea of diffusion. So some of this confused me for a while, so it took a little bit. Um, so if we look, well, no, that's terrible. Hold on one second. Let's just call this an alveoli, right? And then we're going to have our blood vessel down here. Now, typically when you talk about oxygen and carbon dioxide, we talk about perfusion limited, right? So that's gonna be, that's gonna rely on the amount of blood flow that goes through, um, not necessarily the ventilation. What they, what they talk about in regards to the diffusion is this D, D, uh, D, uh, diffusion limited carbon monoxide. Okay, so we're gonna get to that in a second. The, the first thing I wanna talk about is the idea of diffusion and this idea that, um, we obviously have to cross this barrier. So this is the main point that you, that you wanna get across is that this barrier is where uh, all of the oxygen is gonna get into the blood, all the carbon dioxide is gonna get out. So when we talk about these different diseases, obstructive versus restrictive, this is a major component of it. So let's start off with the obstructive things. Now, when you talk about COPD, particularly emphysema, there, there's not a problem with this diffusion gradient, right? So they talk about with emphysema, they talk about these um, pink puffers, right? They're pink because they're oxygenated, right? So they don't have a problem with this diffusion component. It's just the idea that uh, the, the dynamics of the, the lungs and the, the architecture of their chest, uh, that doesn't let them get the, uh, the, carbon di the carbon dioxide out. Right, so that's the problem. So it's not really a diffusion component that comes into play. Now with bronchitis, it's also obstructive uh, and they call them the blue, blue bloaters. Now, the reason they're blue uh, is because they have mucus plugs in there, but technically it's really not this diffusion component that comes in to play. But when you talk about these restrictive diseases, so let me back up. So again, when I, when I say these obstructive diseases, it's not exactly the parenchyma or the actual, uh, the lung and the alveoli and this diffusion component. That's not really the problem. The problem is the fact that, you know, they have this barrel chest and uh, the, the outer aspects, the pressure that's, that's forming on the outer aspects of the lung um, and, and, you know, the outsides of the lung that's causing the problem, okay? But when you talk about these restrictive diseases, we're talking about fibrosis and stuff around this diffusion gradient. 
Okay, so you can think of these obstructive things as like a chest wall or an outer aspect of the lungs and a pressure problem, whereas the restrictive lung diseases come into this diffusion component. Okay, so this what the, the reason they use carbon monoxide here, you really don't need to know a lot about the testing and how they all do that. But the reason they use carbon monoxide is because it's dependent on this diffusion gradient. Okay, so they could use all those little tests they use with the carbon dioxide and they could figure out uh, because carbon monoxide is reliant on this diffusion gradient, um, they can use that to determine if there's some sort of problem getting blood or excuse me, getting air uh, from the alveoli to the blood and vice versa, okay? So that's a big component there. Now, uh, people also get, fused, get confused with this VQ mismatch and this whole uh, idea of dead space. So let's start out with the dead space. Now, technically, um, if we had some sort of, remember we're saying restrictive lung diseases, we're having a problem with diffusion. We've thickened this membrane here. So the, the, the you're not able to diffuse um, the oxygen across. So what you actually did is you actually increased dead space, right? This right here would be your normal dead space, right? You're not, there's no, there's no actual, this is the conducting system. There's no actual oxygen exchange across it. Now, if we had some sort of restrictive lung disease, where actually that where the blood is not going, I'm sorry, the air is not going to go through, uh, the, you know, this diffusion gradient, we actually increased our dead space, right? Any portion of the lungs that's not going to have oxygen or diffusion going across it is considered dead space. So in essence, if there's any uh, decrease in this diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, we're saying we increase dead space, okay? So I want you to keep those two, uh, I, I know this is a good bit of review, but I want, to, want you to keep those two separate. Now, another concept that was a bit tricky, let me clear this real quick. Um, Let's see, uh, so if we, um, this idea of this VQ mismatch, right? So when we talk about ventilation, uh, it, it's ventilation over, uh, sorry, it's a Q, not a P, and that's ventilation over perfusion. So one, one's going to have to be the problem, right? Are, are you having problems getting air in or are you having problems perfusing the lungs with blood? Either way, you're going to have this mismatch. Now, one of the tricky things is if we look at kind of like a larger alveoli here, what I had confused for a while is um, this idea of shunts, right? Now, if you had some sort of mucus plug here, right, that's considered a shunt, okay? This is a shunt. I know that they talk about shunts in the heart and we, we kind of, you can kind of think of the idea of shunting blood around uh, as, as being a shunt. But when we talk about it in the lungs, the shunts are considered air blockages, okay? What I'm trying to say is that uh, if the lung was clear and you had a pulmonary embolism, for, for instance, right? Yeah, well, let me, let me put it over here, right? You had a pulmonary embolism, so blood cannot go across here. This is not considered a shunt. Okay, it's considered a pulmonary embolism. So anytime they talk about a shunt, they're talking about some sort of air blockage. So I had that confused for a while. Um, so just keep that in mind. When, it, when you're in the lungs, the shunts are regarding to some sort of blockage in ventilation. Now, granted, if you did have something, uh, sh uh, shunt, uh, some sort of air shunt, say some sort of mucus plug or foreign body or whatever, right here, what happened to your dead space, right? You actually technically like decreased it, right? Because this area would have been dead space too before you get to the diffusion component. So technically you've decreased it. Okay, I haven't seen any questions like that, but it just gets the point across that this is, a, this is the idea of a shunt. Now, another, some other terminology you may come across is, um, sorry, is this idea of this VQ mismatch. So whenever, you know, if you do the math, um, you can figure out that if there's a problem ventilating the lung, say you have some sort of mucus plug or whatever, um, um, then the, the, the numerator is going to go down. Now your perfusion is fine. So anytime they say the VQ is, uh, is approaching zero, that means you had a problem in the numerator, right? So you have a problem ventilating the lungs for whatever reason. Now, if they say that um, if you have a problem, 
um, perfusing the lungs, some sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, perfusion problem, um, you know, if there's, if there's some sort of heart defect or whatever, and you're not perfusing the lungs properly, some sort of shock or anything like that, then the VQ is going to approach infinity, right? Because, you know, um, the new, the denominator is going down. Okay. So if you ever see those in the questions, uh, just put, put V over Q and just work it out in your head, what's going on. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to say for that for now. Um, the main thing was the idea that like, I thought, I thought a pulmonary embolism was considered a shunt because it, it does. I mean, you, you shunt the air away from that area, but it's not in the lungs. The shunt is regarding um, uh, air blockages. Okay. So we'll go through my notes. Um, I'm not sure if I posted these up, but I will post all my notes up on, on my drive um, a little later. Okay. So, right. Of course, you always have to know this. You have to do the math there. We took our exam on this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a question, a couple questions doing this. You have to know it. You have to know how to figure out. You'll probably have to use two equations uh, to work out and then add those together to get the number. So make sure you're able to do these um, backwards and forwards. All right. Um, and you know this too, right? Our type two pneumocytes are super important. That's going to make our surfactant around what would we say, like 24 weeks um, around that time frame. Um, if for some reason uh, you the you know the, the the child needs to be delivered prematurely, you can give the mother glucocorticoids, um, and uh, that will help to um, um, speed up the process of making surfactant. So that's a good thing to know uh, there. And then the, the type one pneumocytes just basically make that diffusion that diffusion barrier. Okay, um, you know this. I think in term one they had that nice little graph that showed you like where everything goes, the cartilage, how far the cartilage goes, how far the goblet cells go. Remember, um, you want the goblet cells up top. You want ciliated columnar epithelium up top, primarily just to sweep all of the, the excess stuff out of the way. Um, and then, of course, it's going to be you want cartilage there because you don't want it to collapse. Okay. Let's see. Now, the only thing atelectasis is, is a downstream collapse, okay? So if you have some sort of like, um, if you think of the, the air dynamics, if you have some sort of plug uh, there, then uh, it, it'll tend to collapse downstream of that. So any sort of atelectasis, so when you think of chronic bronchitis, that's a big one. Uh, any sort of things, you can get multiple types of atelectasis. So um, if there's an obstruction this way, this is the resorption you need to know these definitions. Um, you could see it there. So if it's, it's there, it kind of has this pulling effect this negative pressure. So it causes this atelectasis, you know, it would start here and end up pulling the whole lung down like that. Um, and y'all are getting into the, uh, the, um, what do you call it? These small groups where y'all are doing things. So you need to get some of these words down, this tact off the 99 thing, all that. Um, but truthfully, you won't, I don't think any of us will really appreciate all these different sounds like crepitus and all that until we actually hear it in the hospital. So um, just kind of make sure you understand the words and it, it maybe not what it sounds like, but associate the words with what disease pattern you have, like rails and uh, crackles with pneumonia, stuff like that. Uh, and you'll be able to answer the questions. All right. Then you have compression atelectasis. Remember, we talk about um, um, pneumothorax, right? Tension pneumothorax primarily are the bad ones. So if you have some sort of blunt trauma to the, to the lung, uh, through the chest wall, you will get this compression, right? So opposed to the atelectasis coming from like a sucking effect from sort of, sort of blockage, you're getting this compression atelectasis from the outside. So of course we have, we know this, this is cl uh, classic trachea deviates away from that, right? Because all of that excess pressure, when you have that blunt force trauma here, um, the air gets in and it can't get out, right? So it's going to keep compressing. It's going to push this right lung all the way to the, uh, you know, to the other side, uh, and it's going to make the tra trachea deviate. So got to get the, the patient to the ER, put the chest tube in and try to get that air out. Okay. And then they have contraction atelectasis. This is what you see when those, um, when those fibrotic diseases, okay. Um, you want to try to, yeah, they are potentially reversible. Uh, more often than not, you're just going to, uh, with medication or prevention of, you know, you know, so, so a lot of times this is like uh, occupational hazards, you're going to slow down the process, um, but technically it is reversible to a degree. Then neonatal, adelect, neonatal atelectasis, we're talking about um, our deficiency in surfactant, right? The, 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 the alveoli are the most downstream component of this complex. So if you have, don't have surfactant and those alveoli collapse, 
um, by definition, that's atelectasis, okay? So, and that's what we see with RDS. Um, yeah, you know, I get y'all are gonna y'all are getting to the point. Like it's you know, um, when I write my notes, I I I don't dive too deep into like I don't like I won't write like all of this. Like I feel like everything's eosinophilic, you know, like I, I try to use buzzwords like if they have you know somebody's name, certain um components to it. Um, but if some word really sticks out that's that's uh specific to this disease, try to put it, but um, by no means do I like, like sit there. Cause I feel like a lot of these have a lot of crossover. So the thing about things that cross over, it's hard to test. So you're looking for very specific uh, differences in these, um, disease patterns, but obviously y'all, y'all are aware of that by now. Okay. Yeah. But so, so a perfect example, like ground glass appearance on x-ray, like that's something that they could put in the stem of a question. And then you should be able to, uh, notice that even though that's kind of like that fried egg appearance, this, everything's fried egg, so uh, it comes up a lot. All right, so then we talk about acute lung injury. Um, you see this abrupt onset, hypoxemia, so that's hypoxia is difficulty getting blood in or lack of blood coming in, right, into your lungs. Hypoxemia is uh, uh, low oxygenation in, the act, in your actual blood, okay? So that's the whole point. Uh, hypoxia is one thing, but if you can't, if you don't have that diffusion, you're gonna get hypoxemia. So uh, acute lung injury is one of those things that um, can be very bad very quickly. So you need to try to uh, get the patient in a situation that's going to um, help to uh, alleviate that. Problem is, you know, in which the macrophages get around and you start having fibrosis, um, uh, you know, that's problematic. You know, fibrosis is, you know, it's scar tissue, right? So it's, it's kind of hard to uh, uh, fix that after that point. And keep in mind, I didn't mention this before, but these, these type 2 pneumocytes uh, also help in the, the reparative process of the lungs as well, too. So um, they're pretty a dynamic of a cell type. Let's see. Um, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, and when we talk about different fluids, right, uh, you know, this isn't exactly on the page, but it reminds me, anything that has exudate has stuff in it, right? Transudate, when they talk about that sort of diffusion, um, if you have uh, pleuritis or something like that, transidate is basically just water. Exudate means there's stuff in it. There's neutrophils and stuff like that. So keep that in mind because that, that'll kind of tell you uh, what's going on um, uh, in the process. And hyaline membranes, when they form, that's kind of that beginning process of fibrosis, right? And you can see that here, and this just goes through the process, the, the acute phase, these hyaline membranes are forming. Then you're like, we need to stop it now before the fibrosis gets beyond the uh, point of repair. So these type two pneumocytes kind of come in and, and do their job. All right. Cool, right, all right. Um, let's see, what's this about? All right, so obstructive, what's the big thing about obstructive? Remember, uh, your FEV1 to FVC ratio is gonna go down. We, this is like a dead giveaway on the, on the uh, FVC one, no, it's not FVC, force vital capacity. Yeah, FVC one over, what is it? F, F I should know this. Um, we'll come across it. Does anybody, what is it off the top of your head? FVC, force, shoot, we'll come across it. FEV one over FVC. FEV, oh yes, for, force expiratory volume in one second over force vital capacity. Thank you so much. Now, the big thing in obstructive is, so remember, they, they don't have a problem getting the air in. It's just once it's in, everything collapses on itself. That endpoint pressure kind of moves down towards the alveoli and everything collapses. So then they can't get the air out, right? So technically, both of these values are gonna decrease, but that, that force, uh, expiratory volume in one second is going to decrease tremendously, right? Because, you know, that's the whole idea. They can't, they can't get the air out. So they have this, um, this obstructing problem. Uh, they end up getting a barrel chest. They, their, their um, functional reserve capacity, their residual volume goes up. Um, so you need to keep this in mind because in the questions, they will put, a lot of questions will put this. The FEV, FEV1 to FEC ratio uh, is low, right? Meaning your, your, your numerator went down significantly more than your denominator. Okay. So that right th there, right then and there tells you that 
uh, you have an obstructive problem, okay? So you could throw all the restrictive stuff away. Now, the big one, remember emphysema and bronchitis tend to go together. So it's like kind of like a, uh, when they, it seems like when they teach it, they kind of separate them. But if you're gonna have emphysema and you're smoking, uh, you, you're probably going to get bronchitis too. So let's talk about emphysema. So what ends up happening, and this is a good thing to know, is that emphysema is going to cause this centroacinar uh, emphysema, right? This centroacinar problem. Whereas what you see in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is this panacinar. We had a question like this on our last exam, um, or maybe it was a practice question that came across, but I saw it recently, right? So they're differentiating the two. Now, the, how do you differentiate these? Um, well, besides this component being a little bit different. Remember with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you're gonna get cirrhosis of the liver too. They really need to tell you that, uh, or you know what they do a lot of times? They'll, they'll give you an emphysema and they'll tell you that the liver lab values are normal. So right there, um, you can rule out alpha-1 antitrypsin, okay? So um, another thing, uh, I, smoke rises, so you tend to get emphysema, uh, the centroacin or emphysema in the upper lungs and with alpha-1 antitrypsin, it tends to be in the lower lungs, okay? So remember the idea of alpha-1 antitrypsin is that these neutrophils are going to produce elastase and this alpha-1 antitrypsin is able to uh, counteract this elastase. So that's the whole process. Um, so if someone smokes that has alpha-1 antitrypsin, they can develop this emphysema in like in a couple of years of smoking, okay? So um, keep that in mind when you do this. Um, yeah, that, yeah, like I was saying, this antitrypsin helps to, uh, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin helps, helps to counteract this elastase. Elastase is an enzyme that breaks down elastin, right? Keep it simple. So if you're breaking down elastin, you're really messing up um, uh, that, that endpoint, the, uh, you know, the, the um, alveoli. Um, another thing that keeps coming up that we're seeing recently is this idea that, you know, if the acinus is really kind of, I mean, that's a just, just to get the point across, right? So if this is normal, um, this is what you see in emphysema, okay? And the point I'm trying to get across is that you get decrease in diffusion um, in this situation, not because you have a problem here in this diffusion points, right? Or even here, it's because by... Um, by breaking down these septal walls, uh, right? By going to, to this process, you lose a ton of surface area. You know, it's kind of like the microvilli in the, in the GI tract, right? All those little villi add surface area. So you're able to absorb a lot of stuff. This norm, normal process right here has a ton of surface area. So emphysema will break down these septal walls. So you, you lose a ton of surface area, okay? So they're not able to properly diffuse. Um, uh, oxygen across, but it's not necessarily the actual diffusion gradient, the, the, the transition. It's just the fact that you lose so much uh, surface area. Um, let's see what else. Right. So look, so like, look at this, this is all broken down. Um, like I was saying, this is, you know, this, these septal walls are being broken down. You're losing a ton of surface area. You're losing elastin. Um, you're not able to even contract. So you can't get the air back out. Um, so it's a big problem, hyperinflated lungs, you get that barrel chest um, uh, formation. Again, pink puffers, right? Meaning they get oxygen uh, in, they tend to not be able to get carbon dioxide out. Remember, if you can take it to another level, the carbon dioxide that they can't uh, get out acts as an acid. When we do those um, you know, uh, respiratory acidosis type problems, if you can't get carbon dioxide out, you're holding on to acid, so you end up with respiratory acidosis. Okay, and as you learned in cardio, uh, some of these problems, anytime you have some sort of pulmonary pathology, pulmonary hypertension that leads you know, backwards to right heart failure, it's gonna be called core pulmonale. So in other words, we're saying that the right heart is having to press against, press against such a high afterload because of this pulmonary pathology, because of this uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, and so it, you develop right heart failure. All right, and again, the FEV1 is significantly lower than the uh, forced vital capacity, okay? And again, we see respiratory acidosis in these patients just because, again, they're pink. They're fine with the oxygenation, just they can't get this uh, carbon dioxide out. All right, so bronchitis, again, uh, in real life, you, you really don't, you know, they really don't separate these things. Um, you know, they go together, but when we talk about bronchitis, we're talking about just a ton of 
mucus buildup. Um, hypersecretion of mucus, uh, you can get mucus plugs. Um, the big thing, and this is a dead giveaway in these questions, they really have to give you these numbers. Um, it's like when you back when you did all of those um, uh, psychiatric disorders, they got to give you the numbers. So as soon as they start throwing numbers at you, you want to start thinking of bronchitis. That's the one off the top of my head in the pulmonary uh, system that they, they really have to give it to you. So three months over two consecutive years. Um, that would, you know, before they can uh, technically have uh, chronic bronchitis. Okay. Let's see what else. And look at this. Look at all this goblet cells that form. All this goblet cells can form excess mucus. Uh, a big thing that comes up, this read index is important. Anytime you see that, it's directly correlating to, um, to bronchitis, okay? So I think, okay, this is it. Uh, this is that read index. All they're saying is that the read index goes up because this thickness of the layer goes up. And it basically makes sense because to make more mucus, you have to have more gland. Let me go back one slide, make sure I covered it. Um, and it could even lead to squamous metaplasia, irritation. Okay, I don't know how high yield that is, but yeah. So anytime that read index goes up, you're adding mucus glands uh, to the, um, the three, three, three layers. All right, and then again, they're, they're considered these blue bloaters, um, which it's, it's still obstructive. They still can't get air out, but the fact that they have so much mucus, it really does interfere uh, with their ability to get proper oxygenation. So if you were gonna define emphysema, you would call it more of a hypercapnic problem. A hypercapnia, you can't get the carbon dioxide out. These patients will have hypercapnia, they can't get the air out, but they'll also have low oxygen. They'll have hypoxemia as well, uh, just because um, you know, those mucus plugs work both ways. You can't really get air in, you can't get air out. Then they collapse, you can get atelectasis with this as well, just with these plugs that form, okay? so keep that in mind. But again, in real life, it kind of all goes together. I started this slide. Um, I, I'm not a big chart person, but when it comes to stuff like this, like these are super important things, things that happen all the time in the States. So um, <clears throat> uh, you can keep it straight uh, with stuff like that. Um, right. But if, if you really just remember pink puffers and blue bloaters, you just work, you work it out in your head pretty well. Cool. Next. Asthma and bronchitis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bronchial asthma. Uh, typically, we talk about this as some sort of allergy response, right? Atopic, um, some sort of sensitization. You're thinking of IgEs uh, being very high with this. Um, so, again, I start this one. This is a good way to differentiate. So Ig, IgE mediated, which by definition is a type one response. It's that immediate response, uh, IgE mediated. Um, childhood, of course, wheel and flare reaction on skin test, uh, allergic rhinitis, atopic eczema. Typically, when you see somebody with, that has some sort of autoimmune problem, uh, they, you can have autoimmune problems that coexist. Okay, so, so I, eczema a, long, a lot of times goes along with atopic um, uh, asthma. Then you could also have non-atopic. We don't talk about this one as much as the normal one, but this is some sort of post-viral problem. So it's not related to some sort of hypersensitivity. So in general, when you think of asthma, we're thinking about this ex extrinsic atopic problem. Um, uh, these got red because I think they're super important, right? So IL-4 is IgE. I think, what is the thing in uh, first aid? Hot T-bone steak. Right, so four is the E in steak. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go look at the immunology section. I, that's that's one of the things that uh, I keep in the back of my head that hot tea on steak to keep these um, interleukins uh, straight in my head. IL-5 is eosinophils, even though honestly, these really go together. So IL-4 and IL-5 kind of go together. IgE and eosinophils, E and E kind of go together. And then IL-13, uh, not super important, but um, it does help with mucus production. Okay, and again, mast cells as well kind of work like, um, uh, you know, they, they'll degranulate. So they, they act as um, um, uh, allergic response as well, sort of like eosinophils. All right. Um, right, and then when we talk about this non-atopic, even most of the time they talk about it as viral, 
but any sort of, uh, you, you know, problematic, you don't necessarily have to be allergic to this stuff, but this stuff is so toxic to the lung architecture. Uh, you're going to get this, this, you know, this chronic bronchoconstriction there. And then some people have aspirin sensitivity, asthma as well. Um, the big thing that they talk about with this is these nasal polyps, right? So they will talk about someone that has aspirin sensitivity and they'll say when, they, you know, they also have these nasal polyps. So um, I would make note of that. Um, and of course, you know, this bronchoconstriction is a leukotriene response. So um, they have certain medications that block the process of making leukotrienes and leukotriene receptors. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but um, or Zilutin or something like that. Um, so, yeah. And then, of course, uh, any sort of occupational uh, hazard kind of works on the same level as this uh, non-atopic um, asthma that can uh, Form. The thing about the occupational one is that it tends to develop, develop after repeated exposure. So it's like your body eventually ends up uh, getting a severe reaction to this. It just takes time. Um, yeah, red for sure here. Um, these are some of those things like may, I may not even like going into the exam, I may not even be able to recite what these actually are. But if I saw these words, I could immediately be like, okay, they must be talking about asthma, right? So um, you know, these are sort of the things that tend to pop up. Now, it's not, that's not you know, uh, necessarily ideal because some of the questions we're getting now on, on the U world stuff, they'll just explain these things and they won't give you the name of them. So, you know, it's a give and take, just kind of like try to balance it out. Some of the more important things like asthma, maybe it is good to know how to, you know, these definitions, but uh, as you know, by now, it, it gets very cumbersome over time. Um, Big thing here, you do get hypertrophy or hyperplasia of these muscles, this bronchoconstriction over time. Um, and also you do get glandular uh, metaplasia. Now don't get this confused if you see this and you're like, oh, they must be talking about bronchitis. Not necessarily, right? So you do get um, uh, uh, hypertrophy of the glands and bronchitis. And um, as well, you can get uh, these submucosal and goblet cells uh, forming. So it is similar. So if you see the goblet cells, don't just jump on bronchitis. Remember these, these as, uh, asthmatics have that issue as well. And then of course, status asthmatic is, is a severe asthma attack. Um, that's not responding to standard treatment. They need to be in the hospital quickly and probably be, um, put on a ventilator. Uh, okay. Right. Again, those. All right, so bronchiectasis, um, it's more of a problem with the, the larger uh, bronchi, right? So this is the structure of the smooth muscle. So you get bronchiolar or bronch yeah, bronchiolar dilation. So after time, eventually, uh, for whatever reason, uh, you get you end up getting this dilation. So it goes into it here, tumor form body, things like cystic fibrosis can lead to it. So it's like this chronic issue with being able to transmit air, get air out. This increase in pressure kind of makes the, uh, the, bron the bronchi uh, dilated and the bronchioles as well. So that's all you really need to know about that. Um, uh, some of the organisms that can do that, that can lead to some uh, sorts of pneumonias and stuff. But it's usually, it's, it, it, the way I think of it is this, this prolonged problem that keeps going with this increased pressure. So eventually you're going to get dilation to help to compensate and help to, you know, keep everything from collapsing down. All right. And you can see this with cystic fibrosis. You can see all of these mucus plugs that form. Again, you know by now how cystic fibrosis works. But the problem is if you don't have water, you're going to get mucus buildup. Uh, so you can see all that here um, that forms. Let's see. Okay. Lead to hemoptysis, obstructive respiratory insufficiency. Okay. So, um, right. And then y'all know about cartagenous by now, uh, sinus inversus, all of the organs are on the other side. But if you just keep, if you remember that this is a primary ciliary dyskinesia. So anything that has cilia that needs to work is messed up. So you can't sweep the lungs out. They're prone to pneumonias. Uh, they get infertility. 
because the sperm can't swim, things like that. I did look up, I was like, why are their organs backwards? Apparently during embryology, the cilia play a large part in dictating where the organs go to which side. Um, so that's why apparently that sometimes their organs are on the other side. And then of course, the sinusitis, you have cilia in your nose as well. So recurrent infections, of course, this recurrent infection can lead to this bronchiectasis, this dilation of the bronchi, um, but it's pretty straightforward when you give you give you this. We did have a question on our last exam. Uh, they gave us cartagers and didn't mention the organs were on the other side. So don't don't just uh, rely on that to be uh, one of, uh, you know, to give it away. Um, okay, so we move on to the restrictive lung disease. So when you versus the uh, obstructive, when you're thinking of the outer aspects of the lungs, this pressure gradient, this dynamic uh, this atelectasis that forms. With restrictive, you're really talking about the inner workings of the lung, this, this parenchymal lining, this diffusion gradient. So it's really this, this, this chronic fibrosis that happens. And um, whereas with obstructive, you can't get air in, you can't get air out. You're trying to figure out just the dynamics there. This is a problem diffusing oxygen across. So it's, it's very much uh, nuanced in, in, in that, in that uh, degree. Right, and then we talked about this before. So alveolitis doesn't sound like a good thing. If the alveoli are inflamed or infected, then um, you're not gonna be able to diffuse uh, uh, blood across, I'm sorry, air across, leading to dyspnea, hypoxia, ventilation, perfusion, mismatch, right? Because you can't get it across. And then of course it could lead to pulmonary hypertension or core pulmonary. Right, and think about that with pulmonary hypertension. If you had this area of the lung, that is not being diffused properly, you have to shunt a lot more blood to a different, I say shunt, I shouldn't say shunt, you have to direct a lot more blood to a different area uh, of the lung. So uh, if, if that's the case and you, you know, you're trying hard to, to properly oxygenate the body, that could lead to pulmonary hypertension, okay? So uh, with that, of course, can lead to right heart failure as well, okay? So a big thing here is that, um, the FEV1 and FVC ratio are going to go down pretty much proportionally, okay? Now, the problem with restrictive is that with this fibrosis of the parenchyma, the lining of the lung and the alveoli, you can't, you can't properly expand if everything's fibrose, right? So the air that's, you, you can't expand it, so you can't get air in. So with obstructive problems, you can't get air out. With restrictive, you can't get air in. So, uh, if there's no air in, your numerator is going to go down, but you're not starting with a lot of air to begin with, right? So your force vital capacity overall is going to go down. So you can think of these going down um, together, um, even increase, but I, I just remember normal. Um, and like we talked about before, this diffusion limited carbon monoxide is going to go down. What that means is there's literally a problem in that diffusion gradient, that little area that's that where oxygen and carbon dioxide are crossing from the blood uh, to the to the uh, alveoli. Okay, so that's a big thing there. That's how you differentiate it. Whenever I do these, that's the first thing I do: is it obstructive or is it restrictive, and then I go from there. Okay, let's see what else. And um, Sprite, so when we look at these different um, fibrotic diseases, don't get overwhelmed with this. A lot of these are very similar in their presentation. So you kind of just need to know the, the basics for how this works. Give me one second, I need to, computer's going down. <clears throat> So a lot of these have a very similar presentation. So you don't need to dive too deep into this, just kind of have you know, a nice definition for like what goes with what. Um, so idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, um, this is this progressive interstitial pulmonary fibrosis that leads to respiratory failure. Being idiopathic, it's a primary problem. Uh, it, so which means it has to, it, it generally is gonna happen with genetically uh, uh, predisposed individuals, right? So um, I believe, it was, so that, as it states here, that the, um, the the process is um, these these people aren't able to repair properly. So it, it's a primary problem with the repair process. If you can't repair, you're going to end up uh, uh, with fibrosis. Then again, a good uh, so like a good thing to remember is this cobblestone appearance, and definitely these honeycomb cysts. You should hopefully they give us a picture. Uh, um, maybe look up uh, um, 
a CT scan of this honeycomb cyst. Once you see a picture of it, you won't forget it. But the point is that when you look at it, um, you can see that, you know, when you look at a normal, no, an, um, uh, a normal CT scan and you see the lung markings, right? This honeycomb cyst, these lung markings go all the way through. It literally looks like a beehive with these honeycombs, which means and you shouldn't see that all the way through the lungs. You could just, you should just see it around the hilum. But it, when you see these lung markings all the way through the lungs, you, you want to think of some sort of restricted problem. Uh, if it's a honeycomb pattern, it's usually this uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial fibrosis. So you can see this honeycomb change. Um, I think the the, the CT scans, if you look at an axial section, it'll do, it, it does a lot more um, justice to this. Right, and as you would expect, if there's a diffusion problem, you're gonna get cyanosis, you're gonna lead to uh, right heart failure. And then clubbing of the fingers just is, is indicative of cyanosis. So you get like little bulging of, of, the, of the tips of the fingers that's indicative of uh, peripheral cyanosis. So anytime you see that, um, you can think of that. Right, so perfect. You see this, um, you can identify it. Uh, all right, now I think we get to get into all the confuse, confusing ones. Yeah. Mm. Okay, non specific. Uh, it says like this chicken wire appearing, appearing um, doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have this. Um, honeycomb change like you would see in the the original one the idiopathic one but you get a fibrosis or a cellular or a fibrosing variant here um you could see that some respond to steroids um sorry i know i'm reading the slides the you know these are uh so similar to me um i i, I literally use buzzwords to remember these um uh like the, the stuff that's uh, in red so yeah so this cryptogenic you can see this patchy subpleural or peribronchiolar areas um, response to steroids. So you know it's some sort of inflammatory, inflammatory process underlying it, but here you won't see this honeycomb appearance. And, right, uh, organizing pneumonia. So again, it, it may be worth just, you know, taking a piece of paper and just like writing these out in their different categories just so you can uh, keep these straight. And then collagen vascular diseases, anything like this, anytime you increase the collagen, uh, you can affect the ability to diffuse um, oxygen across. Now, pneumoconiosis, it's important to know what exactly uh, they're talking about. So cold dust, silica, and then asbestos, as you know, leads to mesothelioma. But these are, a lot of times, these are occupational hazards as well. You can see that. Um, yeah, and especially with asbestosis, it may not show up for like 40 years after you're exposed to it. And then some of these uh, little uh, explanatory or descriptive words are gonna be important just to differentiate these on the exam. Again, because the clinical features, they're all gonna present with cyanosis and clubbing and stuff like that and you know dyspnea. So you really just need to focus on uh, what, what could have caused it. Was it some sort of, um, um, some sort of insult by some sort of occupational hazard, or you know, what is, is it some sort of problem with their reparative pro, uh, reparative ability, as in the idiopathic one? Um, so that's going to be important. And right, the reason asbestos is so important because it was so prominent back in the day, in the '60s and '70s, um, that they used it for everything. It was like a perfect, perfect answer to insulation and stuff like that. And come to find out many, many years later, um, people ended up getting such severe mesothelioma, which is a, a cancer of the pleura, right? So um, it's one of those things, right? And look at this pleural spaces here. You can see this, uh, this thickening here, which could be indicative of, um, yeah, of some sort of infection. And, but it's, yeah, you can appreciate there as well to some of these markings. Right, and yeah, again here, all this yellow area here is uh, indicative of mesothelioma uh, around in the pleural space. Um, some of it's super extensive. It goes all the way through. It even goes through the cavities, separating the upper and lower lobes. Um, so it's, it's very invasive. Silicosis, um, fairly common occupational hazard as well. Some of these uh, acute inflammatory mediators are the same as they'll be in the rest of the body, IL-1, IL-8. 
Uh, what's the other one? I forget. IL-8, uh, TNF, oh, I forget. One of those. Um, uh, and then, so good to know there for silicosis, eggshell calcification. That's a big one, a big buzzword to know for that. IL-1, IL-8, somebody help me out. It's gonna bother me. Anyway. All right, um, and then coal workers as well. Coal is carbon, so that's all they could really ask you about that. Anthrax, not super important, what about right here? Okay, lower lobe tends to be asbestosis, upper lobe silicosis, good differential there. Yeah. All right. And then coal workers, you would expect to get blackened lung. That makes sense because it's coal, it's carbon. So that's what forms there. A lot of fibrosis and these um, occupational uh, problems that form. Sarcoidosis is a weird thing. It's, it's uh, when you think, when you hear sarcoidosis, just think of granulomas, okay? Obviously, caseating granulomas are in regards to tuberculosis. Non-caseating are the other granulomas, in, in my understanding. So any, any non-caseating granuloma um, it can form. Um, so sarcoidosis is, that's what you think about. They tend to get uh, these granulomas in the skin. I think they get them like all over, but in the skin and the lungs are, are most common. So uh, keep that in mind. That could lead to uh, restrictive problems. Type four, which by definition is a delayed type site hypersensitivity, um, which means it's T-cell mediated, right? And, okay. Again, these probably aren't as potent as like the stuff with uh, asthma, but um, fair game for a test. They put that in there. You should be able to identify that this is sarcoidosis. You can see these little granulomas that are forming there. Non caseating, there's no cheese in the middle, whatever that means. Um, right, here we go. Uh, other organ systems skin, eyes, parotid glands, spleen, liver, bone marrow. CNS. So yeah, they're all over, but I think the primary ones they talk about are in the skin and in the lungs. <clears throat> okay, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, um, extrinsic uh, allergic alveolitis and contrast. Okay, so I'm oh, sorry. Okay, so yeah, so this is going to be versus where uh, asthma is a obstructive lung disease. This sort of, this sort of uh, hypersensitivity is going to lead to a restrictive lung disease. Okay. So, excuse me. So you can see stuff like here, this farmer's lung, this hay, again, these are uh, occupational hazards that form as well. Um, all these other things. So, um, and the reason they call this Monday morning blues is because uh, throughout the week you get exposed to this stuff and you go home on the weekend and you feel a little bit better. And as soon as you go back to work, you seem to get these symptoms again, difficulty breathing and stuff. And that's because you're exposed to the stuff that is um, causing the problem. Okay, so just keep this in mind that this is opposite asthma. This is a restrictive problem that forms. Uh, type three and four. So three is gonna be those immune um, complexes that form and then type four, as we said, are the, the um, the T cell, the delayed type formation. Okay. And then I'm trying to think, it's just for the record, uh, we, uh, we, we had our, our first, not the one we just took, the one we took before, um, it was cardio, pulmonary, renal, and heme all together. None of the, like, none of these like crazy restrictive things came up. I think maybe the occupational hazards came up. A lot of the obstructive stuff came up, but like a lot of this is really nuanced. So like, don't, don't get bogged after this exam. Uh, don't get too bogged down. I don't think step really considers this super important. Anyway, you want to keep these uh, separate here. They're both caused by smoking, um, but uh, there are some subtle differences here. So you can see that. Um, yeah, here. So just make sure you can uh, identify the differences. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, proteinosis. Uh, what is that? Defective granulocyte. Yeah, I don't know how super important this is. Sputum formation. I don't remember any questions ever coming up for this, but apparently it's uh, accumulation of surfactant. So if anything, maybe just remember that, but 
this doesn't look familiar to me at all. Acute interstitial pneumonia, aggressive form of this interstitial lung disease, uh, post upper respiratory tract infection. So of course, this up, uh, URI is gonna be acute. So you can correlate that with some sort of acute infection. And then of course, pneumonia by itself is just a fluid buildup in the alveoli. Um, Right, so if, you, if there's fluid in between the gradient between the oxygen and blood flow, of course, you're gonna have problems uh, oxygenating the blood, hypoxemia. So uh, the degree of which you have fluid buildup there is gonna determine how bad it is. So as you know now, there's so many causes of pneumonia, uh, it can make your head spin. All right. Are the, what are these? All right. Now, pulmonary edema versus pneumonia, right? So when we talk about pneumonia, we're talking about fluid in the alveolar sacs, right? Pulmonary edema is more like interstitial uh, uh, development of um, fluid, right? So I, it, I mean, it's not, it's not black and white pneumonia. There's some that gets in the interstitial. Pulmonary edema will clog up the alveoli as well. But in a general sense, pulmonary edema, we're talking about the interstitial, okay? So cardiogenic, anything that is going to increase uh, the hydrostatic pressure, right? So any sort of pulmonary hypertension, um, it, it can lead to increased hydrostatic pressure. You're pushing, the hydrostatic pressure is pushing fluid out of the vessels into the interstitium. So by definition, uh, that will lead to uh, pneumonia. This is important to know, it's red right here, hemosiderin, which is iron, these macrophages, those are indicative of heart failure cells. So if you're getting this pulmonary edema, you're probably, uh, it's secondary to some sort of left heart failure and all of the blood is backing up, which is causing this increased hydrostatic pressure. And then you can have some non-cardiogenic, which means it's basically happening in the lungs, right? So it's acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, it could be a high altitude problem um, where you're having a lot of vasoconstriction to try and to try to um, compensate. Uh, decreased oncotic pressure. So any sort of um, uh, uh, liver problems, any sort of cirrhosis or anything like that, you're not making uh, plasma proteins, particularly albumin. So it, remember that oncotic pressure holds fluid into the vessel. So if you don't have albumin, you can't hold uh, fluid there. So the hydrostatic pressure wins and all of the uh, fluid is going to leave. Okay. Neurogenic problems um, that can happen as well. Head trauma, you know, can uh, throw things off as well. And of course, any sort of pulmonary embolism, you have a backlog of blood and that can cause uh, increased hydrostatic pressure. So that could lead to uh, pulmonary edema as well. Now, of course, we know a PE or pulmonary embolism or a thrombus that forms um, can be a huge issue there, depending on the size, it could cause uh, instant death. So some of the things, as you know by now, these hypercoagulability, uh, problems or any sort of immobility. They talk about an old guy that was on a plane for five, six hours. He gets up, he tries to get up the plane. He can't breathe anymore. He dies. What was the problem? He probably threw a clot to his lung, right? Okay. So, you know, that's an issue. Um, also, any, anybody that has an undiagnosed uh, heart, um, actually, no, those go to the brain. Excuse me. Never mind. All right. Uh, Right, look at this, this is called a saddle embolism. You literally uh, blocked off blood flow to a large part of the bronch bronchial down there. Um, so if anything, uh, actually this is lodged in the main pulmonary artery bifurcation. Uh, so yeah, so you're cutting off blood supply. So again, do we call this, um, do we call this a shunt? Would this be a shunt? It's not, right? Remember we said in the beginning, a shunt has to, and when we talk about the lungs, a shunt is an air blockage. This is a blood blockage. So pulmonary embolism is not called a shunt. Uh, uh, so just keep that in mind, okay? So yeah, this is a huge problem. Right to left shunt, that's what I was gonna say, but that would go, that would go to the, that would go to the, yeah, that would go to the systemic system, which would usually go to, um, to the brain. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Uh, right. And this is characteristic. This is some sort of, uh, some sort of necrosis here in the lung that you can, uh, this is schemic again, far that you can see here. So if they give you a picture of this, you should be able to identify that this is the lung. 
pulmonary hypertension, again, uh, in and of itself, it can lead to right heart failure um, because of the core pulmonale. Um, stuff like chronic obstructive or even interstitial lung disease can lead to it. Uh, you're, the, you're overworking the lungs, especially interstitial. You can't dilate um, the terminal bronchioles. Therefore, um, they're going to get a lot of pressure just because you, you're trying, you're, you're, the blood's trying to work harder and um, to get oxygenation. So um, a lot of these airway problems can lead to uh, problems with blood flow. See, this is saying a left or right shunt, which would make sense because then you could throw a clot to the lung because you go right left okay what did the other one say wait no right to left goes to sorry um no because if it's in the left if the clock goes from the light right side to the left side it goes to the systemic system so you get all right i don't know i don't know what they're getting at uh that's right 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 to left yeah mm -hmm. I don't know, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, what else? And again, if this looks familiar, this kind of looks like that highland arterial sclerosis that forms in the systemic system with chronic hypertension. So you could see this uh, with this pulmonary hypertension as well that forms. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember this being very important either, but it's a primary immune problem that leads to coughing up blood. Maybe that leads to the anemia and then you get pulmonary infiltrates as well. Oh, these include these. Okay, so these are gonna be important. Good pastures is something that comes up. It is a type three autoimmune problem. Um, so you get these, uh, you get these immune complexes that form uh, in the lungs, but also more importantly in the kidneys, which I will come across. Um, wait, sorry, it's type two hypersensitivity. Okay, I'm sorry. No, actually, what happens is you have these autoantibodies that attach to the basement membrane. So it's actually just these antibodies that attach to the basement membrane, and that makes a complex. So it's type two hypersensitivity. These IgGs. They deposit in the kidneys, you end up getting glomerulonephritis, and they you'd also deposit in the lungs. So when they talk about kidney and lung problems in an autoimmune disorder, uh, they're, they're typically talking about good pasture syndrome, pulmonary renal syndrome as well, okay? So just keep in mind these IgGs, type two hypersensitivity, attached to the basement membrane and cause a lot of problems, okay? So iron deposits there as well. Hemoptysis, edemia, pulmonary infiltrates, right? That along with this glomerulonephritis, it should key in on there's some sort of deposits, right? So this got, um, good pasture syndrome that comes up. Now, Wegner's, um, let me just go to this. I think they're, nope, it must have been in cardio. There was like this nice little graph that had uh, Wagner's and Churg Strauss and the other one uh, all lined up. Anyway, okay, so we can talk about Wagner's. Remember, it's Cianca. I believe it's the only one that we come across that's Cianca. Everything else is Pianca. So the Cianca attaches to this PR3 Anca as well, but typically when they do testing, they check for the Cianca. Um, so that would be Wagner's. It's a glomerulonephritis. You, you tend to be, a, it's a small vessel vasculitis as well. So that's what forms there. So you can see this in the lung and the upper respiratory tract. Okay, this pneumonitis that forms. And again, renal system is involved as well. So a good point here is to be able to differentiate. What are we talking about? Are we talking about good pasture syndrome, a pulmonary renal system? Or are we talking about Wagner's? Because symptomatically, they kind of present the same, right? You have uh, difficulty breathing. Um, you have difficulty uh, with the, the renal system, the mature proteinuria. So they need to give you a little bit of extra information. Do we have Cianca there? Um, or do we have some sort of good pasture syndrome uh, with these I, IgG complexes that form? Okay. I think with... Um, in the, in the kidneys, they have these uh, linear immunofluorescence is very characteristic of good pastures because you can see all the IgGs that are lining the basement membrane. All right, good stuff. 
All right. Um, and then the lung cancers. Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is to know, you know, the things that are common are common, right? So that's the things that are commonly tested. So uh, knowing things, the difference is there. The main thing that we still get tested on are these perineoplastic syndromes. So by all means, you need to know those, like specific for squamous cell, you get a uh, parathyroid hormone or parathyroid-like or PRPTH, parathyroid-related, sorry. Yes, Par PTH or parathyroid hormone-related protein. PTHRP? Yeah, it, it's PRPTH, I think. Par parathyroid related. PTHRP. <laughs> Whatever. Y'all know what we're talking about. Um, right, we'll get there in a second. But that's very characteristic. So it's one of those things like your patient comes in with hypercalcemia, they have renal stones, and you're like looking at their lungs, you're looking at their parathyroid gland, you don't see anything. It could be lung cancer. It's, re it's releasing this thing that looks just like PTH. So that's what's causing it, this ectopic uh, uh, um, PTH release or PTH related protein release uh, that's forming. Small cell has a couple of things. You can see, get ACTH release from it. So you can get Cushing's like syndromes or it can actually uh, release ADH, right? So you can get um, symptoms of um, you know, holding on to too much fluid, right? So hypervolemia and um, very concentrated urine. So um, you have to watch out for those. Um, there are some other differences that form as well. Small cell and squamous cell tend to be centralized. Um, they have central foci, uh, whereas adenocarcinoma tends to form on the outside of the lung, okay? Uh, adenocarcinoma is less related. I don't think it's a a clear cut thing, but uh, adenocarcinoma is less related to smoking, whereas squamous and small cell are uh, highly related to a uh, smoking history. Okay. Uh, I have a question, actually. Um, yeah, what's up? So when they're looking at the different like cancers, there I see like the peripheral and central. So what are they? What's the peripheral and central like uh, related to? Like what's it looking at? Yeah, yeah. So sure, let me just. Um, so if you look at. Uh, if you looked at the lung here, uh, the central that they're talking about is centralized around the hilum, right? So small cell and, um, and squamous cell will be centralized around there, okay? Whereas adenocarcinoma and stuff like that, it will be peripherally located, right? Like you'd see them around there. Oh, okay, that makes sense. okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, all right, so... Now, some of the things that can happen are, especially if you, if you have some sort of apical tumor, you can get uh, superior vena cava syndrome. All that is, is the tumor's compressing on the superior vena cava, uh, which means like uh, you can get, uh, it, well, feel, it'll feel like numbness in the hand, but lack of blood flow to the hand. It can even press on um, the, the uh, brachial plexus, I believe. But when they talk about superior vena cava syndrome, uh, it basically means that, um, it, it, it's constricting the blood flow uh, to the extremity. Um, and you know, with Horner syndrome, you're basically pressing on the sympathetic nervous system or the sympathetic chain here that forms. So if you're pressing on that, you get unopposed parasympathetic. So the, the triad is uh, ptosis, meaning uh, the lid comes down because remember there's a sympathetic component in keeping your lid up. Meiosis, constriction of the pupil and anhydrosis. Those, that's the triad they have that and ophthalmosis, what does that mean? Exophthalmosis means your eyes stick out. So anophthosis must mean your eyes are kind of uh, sunken in. I don't know why. The triad's this three. So if they give you that corner syndrome, that you could think of an apical tumor. Um, uh, off the top of my head, I think that's probably the first thing you would think of uh, in that situation. But again, it's, it's a compression thing. Um, oh, even, even recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve crosses, crosses right around there. Oh wait, it's on the... Well, they both are, right? So there's two, but it's, you know, the, other, the left one's around the aorta, but I guess either way in this situation, if you had some sort of compression from an apical tumor, um, you can get some sort of hoarseness as well. So, yeah. Oh, here you go. This is the ulnar nerve compression as well. So then you can get numbness as well on the, the distal digits. Right, and here we go. I would, I would definitely star the slide. I mean, questions for days on this stuff. 
Um, so you could see, keep in mind, if you keep, uh, if you keep squamous as PTH, small cells, everything else, right? So you get this ACTH, again, you get Cushing's type syndromes, uh, you get AD, ADH hyponatremia, right? Why is it hyponatremia? Because ADH brings back free water, okay? Those water channels, those um, in the kidney and the collecting duct of the kidney. It's not aldosterone. Remember, aldosterone brings back sodium uh, with water. So uh, you're, keeping your, um, you're keeping yourself at equilibrium in that case. This is ADH is like a fail safe to just bring back free water. So if you have unopposed free water coming down, you're diluting your serum. So you're going to get hyponatremia as well, for whatever reason, kind of uh, not exactly like the others, you can get Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Remember, we contrast Lambert-Eaton with myasthenia gravis. With myasthenia gravis, you get weakness with movement because of those acetylcholine uh, um, uh, autoantibodies. With Lambert-Eaton, you get autoantibodies against presynaptic calcium channels, okay? So they actually get better with movement. With repeated movement, you get a little bit of calcium each time, so it gets easier. So if you see some sort of problem like that, uh, you can go uh, think uh, small cell. All right, uh, lymph node metastasis. You know, they... So, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, you know, when I'm taking my notes and stuff, like, do you really need to focus on all this? A lot of times these lists don't really matter, but this is a pretty, since, since, um, since lung cancer is so prominent in the U.S., uh, lymph node metastasis is, is really um, uh, something you want to want to keep in mind. All right, so we can dive into it a little bit better. Um, Non-smokers, uh, um, most, um, most common primary lung tumor, actually that surprised me. Um, Anyway, uh, non-smokers uh, metastasizes uh, quickly, widely, and again, peripherally located, slow, uh, slow growing. Okay, kind of uh, yeah, weird that it um, it grows slowly, but it metastasizes so quickly that usually doesn't go together. But anyway, just basic, keep it together. Non-smoker, peripherally located. That should kind of key you in on that. Um, lipidic pattern. Uh, they like those words there. Sorry. This keeps coming up. You see it down here under adenocarcinoma, lipidic pattern. That's characteristic for that. Okay. So remember adenocarcinoma, we're talking glandular. Adeno means glands. Okay. So adenocarcinoma, glandular metastatic cancer or glandular cancer. Okay. Um, I highlighted these earlier. I don't think they ever came up. All right. So squamous cell, centrally located. Men more than women. Maybe because men tend to smoke more than women. I would have uh, assumed that. Uh, smoking history as well, central necrosis with cavitation, okay? Some of these key things. Keratin pearls, any squamous cancer you have in the body, it is squamous, so it is gonna form keratin pearls. Anytime you see keratin pearls, think squamous cancer. Keratinization, squamous cells, right? Skin cells, epi epithelial cells, all right? So these keratin pearls are what form. All right, neuroendocrine in origin, right? So neuroendocrine cells, uh, which can lead to these uh, formations of um, um, these perineoplastic syndromes as well. So it's even more convoluted than that because typically we get, we get questions with just ACTH and ADH, but it could even be gastrin. So you can get hyper um, secretion of acid in the stomach or calcitonin. So you get hypocalcemia because calcitonin calcitonin pushes calcium into the, uh, into the bone. But uh, for all intents and purposes, as long as you remember ACTH and ADH, you should be fine. And again, lymph node spread. Uh, I highlighted this, but I don't think it ever came up. This, um, oh, you know what? Actually, take that back. I think we did see a picture like this. Maybe commit this one to memory. Um, this we idea did. Of, we did, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so uh, make sure that you can distinguish the histo. Again, histo can be your friend in the path stuff because they can also give you a patient presentation, give you the histo, not diagnose the patient, and then ask about the perineoplastic syndrome. So it's like, yeah. what would you likely see as a consequence of this cancer? So they can either put the small cell or the squamous cell because those are the two that are big perineoplastic ones. And then you're going to have to pick, you know, increased calcium or something like that. So make sure that you can um, connect those two. Right. And they could even take it a step further and say the patient comes in with kidney stone. Why do they have kidney stones? Calcium-based kidney stones. Well, because they have hypercalcemia. Why do they have that if they're, you know, if they're, you know, PT, their normal PTH is, or their actual, you know, pituitary PTH is normal. You need to be thinking of an ectopic, uh, an ectopic source. Now you should be able to look at this 
this picture and say, this looks like cancer, right? Look at these cells. This, this is very highly mit mitotic cells. Look at the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. Look how many cells they are. Like there's a lot going on here and that's problematic. So uh, again, that could be a giveaway for it. If nothing else, then just, just cancer in and of itself. All right, large cell, uh, they don't really talk about this one too much. Those are the three ones um, that we already covered are what they really like to talk about. Then carcinoid tumors, anytime you think carcinoid, you think serotonin, right? What's the byproduct of serotonin? Five. Uh, 5-H-I-A-A in the urine. It's too much calcitonin, okay? Uh, that would make sense. Uh, ser too, sorry, I said calcitonin. Too much serotonin, right? Uh, if you get 5-H-I-A-A in the urine, that's the byproduct. Um, neuroendocrine, that makes sense because it's serotonin. Klutschke cell or Kalitschke cells, um, I would know that as well, okay? So carcinoid tumors. How would this patient present? Well, with serotonin syndrome, right? Flushing, uh, uh, things like that, um, you know, tach uh, tachycardia um, and such, right? Again, these cells aren't as bad as the other ones, but look how big these nuclei are. They're huge compared to the cells. So it looks like a lot of stuff's going on. Uh, these do tend to form higher up in the bronchus, okay? So if anything, when you're thinking of, uh, you know, the where everything falls, you know, I put, put them in a pretty midline, not midline, but like midway through in the bronchus area, bronchi. All right. Um, I don't think they really got into the differences here. As long as you know that serotonin is the problem, uh, should be there. It's flushes, cyanosis. Oh, diarrhea is the other big one with uh, serotonin that you see. So, yeah, definitely know that. And then look at this. this. Look at this. This is all. So this is the actual lung right here. This is just that little layer of pleura. Look how extensive it is, right? This is all mesothelial. Look how, I mean, that's, that's insane. Um, right, so risk factor asbestosis, uh, but if, if they talk about some sort of pleural cancer, um, I, would, I would lean towards asbestosis for sure. Hamartoma, uh, these are just nodules that form, not super important. Um, did they say, no, okay, I won't get into it. All right. Um, No, I think you're good there. And then again, this is, again, as I said, I'm not really a chart person, but when it comes to differentiating things such as these, these important, uh, these are where the test questions come from, okay? Definitely know the perineoplastic syndrome. All right, what's next? Oh God, and for the record, so y'all know, this will make y'all feel better. Our BSCEs, there've been no farm on them whatsoever. Like, I don't know about Lindsay, but like, I don't even study farm too much for these things. Neither uh, do unless, I. <laughs> unless, unless I'm doing practice questions and they come up, like I'm not making an effort to go back through these lectures because they, they, just, they just haven't come up. Like your BSC one, I don't think y'all had any either, but um, uh, yeah, so far in turn five, like it's been, not that they've been easy, but they've been um, not a lot of farm. Jay Brady, can you, um, before we move to, um, to pharmacology, can you go over the hypersensitivity pneumatitis again? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what lecture? I was, was just that? confused because um, it's lecture four. I, I think. Uh, or RHS bit, seven. Uh, all right, so leg pulmonary four. I think the big difference there is just to be able to differentiate that it's it seems just like asthma, but it's a um, it is a restrictive lung disease versus, uh, whereas prototypical atopic asthma is going to be a, um, um, a, an obstructive lung disease. Here we go. Yeah. So extrinsic. Yeah. So it, it falls under a restrictive lung disease, but it still is a hypersensitivity that forms, um, there, but a, uh, other than that, um, um, it's very <laughs> similar. Wouldn't you be allergic, for example, to mold? So you would, wouldn't you have asthma then? No. Does that make sense? I, I don't think it's necessarily like a, a, um, an abnormal response. Like, I think it's like, a pro, like I said, like prolonged exposure to something. So it's not like you were predisposed to it. Like you have some sort of like um, genetic problem with certain, you know, like with pollen, right? Which be atopic or an IgE response. This is like some sort of prolonged exposure, like an um, occupational hazard to something. So it, it forms over time. Like it could, it could literally happen to anyone. It's not like it happens as a child just because you were just genetically uh, predisposed to it. So um, it has a lot that goes 
similar to uh, uh, to normal asthma, but this is more this is a restrictive lung disease that happens over time, typically due to um, occupational exposure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And like it says here, like it's it still falls on. So like whereas a um, atopic uh, asthma falls under a type one IgA response, this will be a type three and type four. So it takes time, especially this type four, this delayed type, for your T cells to kind of get aggravated with the with the fact that like you're around mold all the time, right? So eventually they did just uh, you know you get a response to it as well. So Ig IgG response. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right, so did we need to know these? Yeah, we did, didn't we, Lindsay? The difference is... Yeah, I think yeah, we maybe uh, had one question on what, like, diagnosis-specific asthma severity in this patient. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think maybe this determines the, the treatment regimen, right? Is that right? Y'all probably know better than us at this point. But... Um, yeah, so bronchodilators, asthma, y'all have come across these already, um, but any sort of beta, uh, beta, beta 2 agonists, bronchodilate, by all means, don't give these people beta blockers. It's a good way to lose your license. Um, but yeah, so the short acting versus long acting, I would definitely commit these to memory. Um, albuterol being the, the first line for most, and then salmeterol as well is used uh, pretty uh, often. You need to know which ones are short and long. Um, I think I, I, it's been a while, but I think at the end of this, they give you a chart that shows you um, when to use what. Um, uh, important, these beta twos, remember uh, from first day, alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two is uh, G-I-S-S, -S, no, yeah, well, uh, Q-I-S-S, -S, KISS. Um, so beta two falls under S, so it's G-S, simulates a dental cyclase, and C amp, all that stuff from way back. Um, Short acting, so we won't go through all this stuff. I mean, you know, with the with the drug regimens um, or with the drugs, you kind of just have to have a definition of how they work. Um, so this should be pretty straightforward. Anticholinergics, if you're, you know, um, anything cholinergic is going to compress or uh, constrict. So anticholinergics will help to dilate. So ipitropium as well can be used uh, if somebody has some sort of, uh, high, um, I know, uh, some sort of. Extent, not extensive, but uh, oh, exaggerated response to some sort of beta-2 agonist, you could do ipitropium. Um, I'm sure there's a couple of asthmatics in here that could uh, teach this a lot better than me, So, um, but I'll do my best. Um, yeah, always uh, uh, adverse effects are going to be important as well. Um, yeah, methyl xanthine, you know, they you know this, this is theophylline, it's kind of like caffeine. Uh, they don't really talk about that too much. Um, right. And of course, corticosteroids can be used as well. You just, the problem with those and using corticosteroids for long-term treatment, uh, is not ideal, um, you know, cause it messes with the kidneys and all that stuff, um, uh, with your cortisol among other things. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. So as we go on, I mean, like, mm, I guess fair game, but if, you know, some of the drugs you've never heard of before, you know, I would literally just know like what they do and maybe a, um, just a little definition inhibiting mast cell degranulation, you know, fine that you should be able to answer the questions with that. Omalizumab, I think I've seen commercials for this actually, um, prevents binding to IgE, makes sense for asthmatics as well. Um, and then here's our leukotrienes. They like these as well. So xylutin is that uh, inhibitor. This uh, five uh, lip lipoxygenase makes actually leukotrienes. It's that last step in leukotriene synthesis, I believe. And then you also have these leukotriene receptors. Of course, leukotrienes uh, come from the arachidonic acid pathway. They're going to cause bronchoconstriction. So if you can block these, uh, it'll help with uh, keep the airways open. Uh, what is this? That sounds familiar. What happened here? Inset exacerbated respiratory disease. And oh, you know what? Oh, that's what happens, right? So if you give NSAIDs and they and you, you block the pathway of making cox, everything's gets shunted to making leukotrienes. 
So therefore you get bronchoconstriction. So um, just keep that in mind, right? So if you're gonna block the pathway to make prostaglandins you know, in that arachidonic acid pathway, everything's gotta go somewhere. So you end up making liquid triangles. So people that are predisposed to asthma and stuff, you need to be aware of this, this nerd effect. All right, here it is. Yeah, unfortunately, you need to know this, right? So you have to take the first one and see that they're gonna give you the symptoms of this, you know, two asthma attacks a week, wakes up at night with asthma. So you need to be able to take that, make and see where they fall in this category, and then you can decide what to give them. Okay, so that's fair game for your test questions. Um, what else? Right, of course, COPD management, first thing you wanna give is give us the patient oxygen, right? Um, even, you know, um, um, if it's bad enough, they could, you know, they, they send them with uh, at-home oxygen, but if in the hospital, by all means, you can just hook them up. Uh, bronchodilators as well can help with these patients um, to kind of keep those airways open so they could get that air out. Uh, inhaled corticosteroids does not slow the progression of COPD. I mean, that makes sense. Um, but you can improve lung function, yeah, by kind of keeping those airways open. Anacetylcysteine, uh, that's in mu mucinex, I believe. Uh, and then that can help with uh, breaking down mucus for um, uh, chronic bronchitis patients, probably even asthmatics if need be, or if you have some sort of URI. And then of course, antibiotics. So this is all fair game too. Um, we had to correct this. I don't know if y'all had to too, but make sure that's right in your notes if you have it. Um, but yeah, you need to know these as well, what, they, what grouping they fall under. Um, right, same stuff. Rhinitis, glucocorticoid spray the histamines, any of these fall, that, that should make sense. All right, then oral antihistamines as well should help. Uh, H1 receptors, right? Remember H2s are in the stomach. H1s are gonna help with that, um, that response, that, um, you know, that uh, allergy type response or that, you know, you know what I mean. Um, and then decongestants, either alpha one, uh, alpha, yeah, alpha adren uh, adrenergic agonists, right? So they're going to cause vasoconstriction. Um, so that'll, that'll help dry up your nose. Cough, codeine, dextromethorphan as well, right? Codeine will help with the pain and dextromethorphan as well with the cough, that the cough reflex. Um, correct. I think all I have left are the, um, the respiratory infections. Did y'all not? Did I miss something? Did, didn't y'all do, did y'all do a, a lecture on, um, what's it called? Uh, chem chemotherapy drugs? For, yes, we did. Yeah. yeah. That was a uh, week four for us, yeah. This, is it this? There was three lectures for it. Uh, but it, it included the, Included the lung cancers. Okay. How about yeah, when second lecture? I think second okay. and third kind of included them. Okay, so Lindsay, when, when you do uh, when you do the red blood cell stuff after you're done, yeah. I'll go back. I'll go back and do the chemotherapy regimens. Those three, yeah. three lectures, three lectures, right, guys? Yes. So okay. it's it's really just the anemias. That's the red blood cell stuff. Yeah, and, and the leukemias and all that, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah I'll, do, I'll do the chemo stuff after Lindsay's done. All right, so let's quickly go through this. Um, as we know, everything can cause uh, pneumonia, right? It could be uh, viral, bacterial. Uh, being able to differentiate it is, um, is the problem. Usually you just get in a cough in a cup, you know, get some spew, a sputum sample and you can isolate the bug of interest, right? So on the test questions, you need to know what's gram negative and all that nonsense. Um, I know it's a pain. I still don't know those as well as I'd like, but um, yeah. So um, I think this was just intro. Yeah, of course, obviously if you have pre-existing lung conditions uh, or some sort of uh, immunosuppression, which is a big testable topic um, 
you're predisposed to, to different sorts of um, bugs, right? Let's see, I wanna get to the actual, okay. What's going on? Clear discharge, typically clear means viral, right? Clear discharge. Um, so this kid's got rhinitis. Um, let's see. So being able to differentiate rhinovirus, typically they talk about that with kids, right? They get that infection uh, around the daycare center. Um, it's usually, I mean, it's self-limiting. Typical vi viral infections are self-limiting in and of themselves, but um, it's highly contagious. Uh, what do you need to know from this? I think I just, what I wrote up here is what's important. Winter, you can get coronavirus and these influenza virus. Summer is typically rhinovirus, enterovirus, and adeno is year long. Um, it's not like you 100% need to know it to answer some of these questions, but like it's in the stem. It's like it's the middle of summer. And so you could kind of isolate like what you're talking about. So keep in mind this rhinovirus, summer camps, things like that are problematic. All right, and you can see here, so stuff, knowing this stuff, unfortunately, is important. Single strand, I think it may all be the same for this. I don't quote me, we'll get there. Uh, so single stranded falls in, RNA falls into class four. Um, and then knowing some of these different uh, characteristics of it, icosahedral, uh, it's gonna be important as well. Spring, summer, fall. Yeah, so crowded areas, daycare settings, super important. Um, yeah, secondary bacterial infections, anytime you have something that predisposes you, you to be uh, even mildly immunosuppressed can lead to something uh, bigger. So a lot of times they'll start out with a viral infection and end up with full-blown bacterial pneumonia, right? Okay, so, and this is another thing, I know y'all are y'all are getting to the point with like all these virulence factors that come up, how many do you need to know? Um, yeah, it's, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I don't, I don't like dive down too deeply into knowing all these virulence factors, but some of them uh, that are important in diagnosis or like that make the, the, the um, bacteria or virus super specific uh, to them, like I'll, I'll, I'll make note of that. But um, a lot of these uh, kind of overlap with each other. And again, if it overlaps, it's very hard to be tested. Okay, what's going on with this guy? Um, and again, remember these viral infections tend to tend to be a uh, very quick onset, right? Um, that happened, um, what was the first one? 24 hours, okay. So let's see what's going on here. 12 to 14 hours, right? So quick, right? Where the bacteria has to get seeded and it takes days to, to figure out what's going on. But these got rhinopharyngitis. So whereas rhinovirus is very, very nasally. This is rhino uh, pharyngitis. Uh, this again, okay, so both rhino and this coronavirus um, definitely falls under single stranded, so they're both group four, so that's good. This one's envelope versus icosahedral. Um, and then we go into this. Um, fair question, uh, are even any of the COVID questions on the exam, uh, are they still all experimental? Because you know they just started writing these questions. We joke about that. We don't know, um, but it's getting to the point where they they probably have enough data on them. So I guess they're fair game. Now you can contrast this with rhinovirus because you see this in the winter time. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty much indistinguishable from rhinovirus, right? All right, and then the third one is adenovirus, where this one's double stranded DNA, so it falls under class one non-enveloped. Um, so again, like I said, with the virulence factors, I don't like learn them all, but this is something that's very specific to this. This uh, attachment protein has this penton base. I don't even know what that means, but I know that it's specific to it, right? It helps to attach. Um, and then what does it mean to say that immunity is transient? It means um, you can have it and um, you know, it's not something that your body's going to be able to fight off from then on, like some sort of some other infections, right? Um, it has different variations to it. So, um, you know, there's no good vaccine for it or anything like that. Happens throughout the year. Uh, big thing that differentiates it there, it can cause pink eye. Okay. So super virulent, highly infectious. Um, oh, it does say there is a vaccine. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, transient immunity just means you're not going to form a strong, um, a strong defense against it because um, there's so much variation there, but it, it does seem to say that. I don't know how well this vaccine works, but anyway. Um, yeah, so pink eye is gonna be the thing. So some sort of conjunctivitis or eye infection, um, keep that in mind and those will keep those separate. Um, what else? Yeah, pink eye, there you go, right. 
uh, all right, and that's it. So again, and that's that's my thought process when I go through these things. I'm like, we're talking about three major viral infections, right? How can I differentiate these on the test, right? Uh, rhino and coronavirus, very similar, different time frames. Uh, uh, coronavirus it also include the pharyngitis, adenovirus, double stranded. Uh, DNA, um, add the pink eye to it, that pinto space thing. That's pretty much where I land when I do a lot of these things to be able to differentiate them for testing purposes. All right, bacterial infection. All right, um, give us a time frame. Thick yellow, yellow green tends to be, uh, and the thickness of it tends to be more bacterial. Three days, so we're, we're going past the one day, that 24 hour period, look how bad this is. That's the sinus, right? When you ever get that sinus pressure right there, uh, you can think about this guy, this, you know, that's real bad, okay? Maxillary sinus. All right, so the big ones is strep pneumo, haemophilus, marxala as well, uh, chronic problems, staph aureus, um, but typically we talk about strep pneumo when we, when we uh, it's like our first thought when we do these. Um, respiratory droplets, you know that. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so a uh, good thing that, that's uh, applicable is the reason children tend to get uh, ear infection, acute otitis media, is the angle of the eustachian tube. There's, I believe, is more horizontal, so it lets uh, it's easier to have transmission there. So that's why they're prone to that. <clears throat> and here we go. So viral upper respiratory tracts under seven days. Bacterial uh, tend to be longer, right? That's uh, over seven days. Uh, tenderness of the face, just because you have that thick mucus buildup. Okay, so these, uh, again, when you're doing these questions, the first thing you should ask yourself, are we going viral or are we going bacterial, right? Even clinically, right? Are we kind of just send them home, which we should do if there's a viral infection, or we're going to put them on antibiotics, right? Um, okay, and acute otitis media, I believe you're thinking of staph aureus is the first thing there, and you can see them through the eustachian tube. Uh, right here, um, yeah, right, you can see that going on here, and the same MRSA is the most common cause, so yeah, staff, bad staff. All right, so this is a great slide to be able to differentiate these, because they're going to tell you a uh, kid comes in, has some sort of pneumonia or whatnot, and these alpha-hemolytic, which is a partial hemolysis, okay? So if they say it's alpha-hemolytic, that should lead you straight to your strep pneumo. It's the most common cause of sinusitis, otitis media, pneumonia, and even meningitis, okay? Of the, of the streptococci, okay? Um, so know that. And then, you know, strep pyogenes is that beta-hemolytic one. Pharyngitis is the big thing there. Strep, al uh, strep allegat, I think that's, they just refer to that as group B strep. It's the only one that falls into group B strep, common cause of neonatal disease. Um, I think the vaginal flora sometimes picks this up. So um, the neonates are predisposed to this in utero. It can lead to meningitis and stuff. All right, so strep pneumo, you know, by now, gram positive diplococci has that big polysaccharide capsule. Remember that that's a problem for people that don't have a spleen, uh, shin, so strep. Hemophilus influenza and Neisseria, big things there. So you need to know that would be a virulence factor. I would commit to memory, polysaccharide capsule, and that's how they make the vaccines. Again, alpha hemolytic, partial hemolysis, uh, pneumoco uh, pneumococcus, right? Pneumonia formed by the cocci. Now, again, very important, uh, optogen, I don't know how to say that, opt optogen sensitive versus the viridan strep, which are the ones you find in, in your uh, dental procedures, okay? Uh, that causes endocarditis. Um, a lot of times when I when I write these out, I don't know you about uh, you guys. I don't necessarily write the negative things. I just write the things that they're positive for. So um, it keeps my notes a little more, bit more concise. So I would write that down, and even maybe bile bile soluble as well. All right, and then it, then it goes into the process of how this all forms. You would expect ILA tumor necrosis factor as well. Um, pneumolysin, maybe that's important to know as well. All right, yeah, so it'll start asymptomatically. It'll kind of just uh, brew there, this biofilm will form, and then, uh, or, or eventually, and then uh, you can become symptomatic. IgA protease is another one that's very important. Um, protease, meaning it cleaves proteins. It'll cleave these mucosal IgA, uh, IgAs. It's a problem because you don't get an antibody response to it if you're cleaving all the IgAs. So that's another virulence factor uh, I would uh, keep in mind there. 
pneumolysin is another one as well, right? And exotoxin. So it's uh, cytotoxic uh, to the cells. So that's always problematic. Decreases your neutrophils and their ability to fight the infection. Capsule there as well. We kind of talked about that. Problems with people that don't have a spleen. So you're thinking people with sickle cell and stuff like that. All right, what else? H flu, um, yeah, not as common. Uh, facultative anaerobe, gram negative now. Coxobacilli, you can see that there. You can cause kind of the same type of symptoms as well. Type B is the one we, we worry about. That is the one that uh, the uh, HIV, um, HIV uh, vaccine is made against, okay? So that's the one that they're really worried about here. Big thing here, it grows on chocolate auger, but you need to know even a further step there that uh, on the chocolate auger too, because a lot of stuff will grow on chocolate auger, I believe. And so what they do is they put um, a factor five and factor 10, this NAD and him in, I believe we had a question on this. So this will help to uh, differentiate it specifically for H flu because they need both of these. So I would definitely make sure you knew, know that. All right, um, what else? So again, these are some of those um, virulence factors. It also, you know, this, I, this IgA protease there as well. It's cap encapsulated, just a uh, protective factor. All right, what else? Epiglottitis, right? That's um, uh, very specific for, for this. Okay, so you see this right here, the thumb sign. You see this, this lighter area looks like a thumb. This epiglottitis, uh, this tripod, this is how this, this child is able to, to breathe a little bit better, better by like extending its, uh, its, its, um, its throat opening, its larynx, um, right? So again, any sort of epiglottitis, you should think uh, uh, hemophilus influenza type B. All right, a little bit less important, um, Moraxella, gram-negative diplococcus, children, mm -hmm. yeah, grows on blood auger, and chocolate. Oh, oh, hockey puck. Yeah, that may be important to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they said something about that, actually. Okay. Uh, what else? Mm, vaccines that are to be known for it. And again, vaccine protocols typically seven to 10 days, up to 14 if necessary. All right, so what's next? All right, mumps, right? First thing you should think of is mumps is peritoditis, right? The parotid gland gets infected. Also orchitis, they get testicular inflammation and infection as well. So these will be single-stranded negative RNA, right? So that falls under type uh, class five. Um, big thing, colleges, crowded conditions as well. Um, right, so peritonitis is the big thing they talk about, this bull neck, uh, swelling of the parotid gland, orchitis as well. Uh, and of course, uh, big thing there, um, they need to tell you in the STEM, if they tell you the person hasn't been vaccinated, if they're coming from a foreign country, you can assume they may not be vaccinated as well. So uh, then you're start starting to think of the things that are vaccine prevalent. All right. Pain, look at this high fever. Here's another differential. Um, typically, viral infections give you a low grade fever. Bacterial infections, you'll get these high, high grade fever fevers, like 104. So, that's another way to differentiate uh, other than the time frame. All right. Yeah, and you can see this here. Now, with the, when it comes to far, far, pharyngitis, right, that has a fast onset for these bacterial infections whereas um, a slower onset. So it's a little bit different there when you think of it. But again, here's this high grade fever as well. And it's more of a thicker discharge, right? And now we're starting to think of strep pyogenes, which is your classic strep throat. Beta hemolytic means complete hemolysis on the blood auger. It falls under group A strep. Pharyngitis is the big one. And you've learned stuff like rheumatic fever and um, acute glomerulonephritis as well streptococcal glomerulonephritis, right? Beta hemolysis, it'll clear the whole area out, okay? Um, yeah, streptolysin. Mm. Right, 
absence of a cough is subjective, is, uh, suggestive of bacterial. Okay, so if there's a cough, you could think of a viral infection. Again, these are more the reason they put these in the stems of the question is because you're going to see so many patients with this. So you know, these are the things that are going to help you uh, differentiate things. All right, chronic tonsillitis. Mm. All right, strawberry tongue. Yeah, that is a complication. Strawberry tongue that forms the sandpaper rash as well. This is second, this is the scarlet fever that forms. This is a sequelae to, um, uh, to the strep infection. You can see that here, the strawberry tongue, little bumps on it and the sandpaper rash as well. Okay, and then we learned it. You learned about acute rheumatic fever. This is that that molecular mimicry, right? So they, um, you end up getting after this is after this, you can get uh, rheumatic heart disease. It shows molecular mimicry, which means when you check for it, there aren't active, uh, there isn't an active infection in the blood, right? It's your actual immune system is trying to fight uh, cells that it assumes or um, uh, strep pyogeny cells, but. Um, Right, that's the whole concept of molecular mimicry. Type two hypersensitivity, right? Again, you're making autoantibodies that you think you're fighting, but you're act actually fighting yourself. And then of course, you can, it can lead to a PCGN, right? Post-reptococcal post glomerulonephritis. Again, they have to tell you uh, that the patient has kidney problems, but they have to tell you they're coming back from um, some sort of recent uh, pharyngitis or throat infection like two weeks ago. Okay, so that'll lead you to that. It's pretty much self-limiting. It'll fix itself up. All right, diphtheria, right? Um, Gram positive. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know how important that is. Let's see, yeah, and it makes these toxins, right? These AB toxins. The big thing about that, the buzzword you wanna remember for diphtheria is this pseudomembrane formation, okay? forms in the neck and it's because of these toxins that form. It's not technically invasive, right? That's why it forms this membrane. But if that membrane ruptures, all the toxins get flushed into your system. So that's the big thing there. But knowing that it, it's non-invasive is, is a good thing to know because it kind of goes together. You could say non-invasive, which is why it forms the pseudomembrane. What's that made of? These toxins, right? So um, that's how that works as well, right? And it goes through the process of how it, you know, the toxins formed. And you can see that there, the nasty little thing, it's full, full, of, full of toxins, right? So if it ruptures, it's problematic. All right, what else? Special auger for it, Tinsdale auger, or even knowing th sodium thiosulfate as well, um, hydrogen sulfide, yeah, I would know that. Um, don't think this came up, um, but it's just another test that they could use. If it's toxogenic, I guess they uh, they form these precipitates. Form toxin plus antitoxin form these precipitates. Precipitates, right? Okay, and that's all I got. All right. Um, any questions? If not, we'll take a few minute break, and uh, Lindsay will go ahead and cover the heme stuff, and then I'll go through the chemo regimens, which don't be, don't be, don't worry about too much because Dr. Dasso's questions are a lot like his um, IMCQ questions, um, really straightforward. So we'll talk about that later. So uh, let's do five minutes and um, we'll uh, finish up. Okay, do we want to get started on the blood stuff? Yeah, go for it. It's all you. Cool. Hold on. No. 
and here while, while Lindsay's setting it up, I'll just preface it with this. Um, a lot of these blood disorders present similarly. So for better or worse, well, then <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, you, a you lot of buzz, thunder, Brady. <laughs> a lot of buzzwords, 814, all those things. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Okay. That was actually my opening statement is that with the blood disorders, whether it's an anemia, um, or whether it's a blood cancer, the anemias are basically, they're all going to present exactly the same, save for like a couple differences in patient presentation, which means you cannot rely on symptoms to diagnose the patient. So the first time we did this in term four, I had a really hard time through this because I didn't switch my brain to that kind of thinking. So in term five, it made a whole lot more sense when I was able to just strip down all the patient presentation away and look at specifically what differentiates the different conditions. So we start off with anemias and um, the red blood cells disorder. It's, it's really anemias. That's what it is. It's lack of, um, you know, hemoglobin delivered to your tissues. That's the, the basic kind of definition you can have of anemia. It's all about hemoglobin. So if you look at the at the labs they give you and they you have a low hemoglobin, you, you have anemia. Um, now, the second thing that's going to major thing is your MCV. This is your mean corpuscular volume. This is what defines the type. So step one, hemoglobin, do you have anemia or, you, or do you not have anemia? Step two, what type of anemia do you have? And the MCV is gonna tell you this. So if it's lower than normal, your red blood cells are small. If it's normal, the red blood cells are normal sized. And if it's macrocytic, it's going to be a large red blood cell. So it's essentially just the size of the red blood cell. Um, so those are the biggest things you need to understand on this slide with respect to does this patient have anemia and what type of anemia it is. So that's the biggest thing here. So introduction, definition, it's just the oxygen carrying capacity. Again, step one, hemoglobin. Do they have anemia or do they not have anemia? Clinical presentation, again, all of them are going to present pretty much the same because if you don't have anemia, go, if, you, if you don't have hemoglobin going to your tissues, you're going to have pretty much the same symptoms. You're, they're going to be pale. They're going to be weak, sometimes hypoxic. Um, so any of these symptoms are just going to clue you in, okay, my patient has anemia. Now what? Um, so just understand that we already talked about this micro macro versus normocytic anemia, still an anemia because it's the hemoglobin, but now you're just talking about the size of the cell and this can help you narrow down what type of anemia you have. If you are not already using first aid, which I actually didn't start using first aid religiously until term five and I regret it wholeheartedly because it could have helped me so much in earlier terms. So if you don't already use it, please use first aid and US MLE, um, whatever version you have, because it breaks it down so much easier. Okay, so microcytic anemias, group of anemias, um, this, is, this is gonna have a lot to do with your, um, like a defective cell. So this is where your um, thalassemias come in. This is where those gene defects come in because something is wrong and then the protein product is either absent or misfolded or there's something wrong with it. So you have that smaller red blood cell. That's why it's um, in this category. Um, let's just intro. Okay, I got ahead of myself. I'm gonna um, talk about this for a sec. Just don't get too, too crazy with the whole changes in the red blood cell shape. Um, the, the, why, the reason this is important is because some of the anemias are going to have a characteristic shape and it's gonna clue you in on which anemia it is. So don't go through and get too bogged down with the changes of the shape. You did that in FTCM. Just understand that sometimes there is a change in the shape and the, and the specific change in shape is going to clue you in on which anemia you have. So don't get too stressed out about this, really don't. Okay. This is also just kind of a, an intro, um, just acute blood loss. You have 
last seven because you don't have the red blood cells. Okay. Hemolytic anemias, this is classified under the normocytic because um, they're, it's the same size essentially, but hemolytic, something happens to the cell to alter its hemoglobin carrying capacity or it alters the oxygen carrying capacity. So all of this is gonna be normocytic. The red blood cells, the size is fine, um, but something happens to the red blood cell because of some, something in um, an organ, something in a gene, and then later down the line, you're going to have the alteration of the red blood cell, which is gonna cause all of that stuff. Okay, so extravascular hemolysis, um, you have in extra versus intra. So it's basically the reason behind the red blood cell getting um, deformed or defective. That's what it is. So extravascular, a lot of this has to do with an organ or something that happens. So a red blood cell tries to squeeze through an area and it gets destroyed, something along those lines. And then intravascular, so um, dying within the vessels during, so different reasons why that can happen. Again, the, this is still kind of an intro because it hasn't gotten into the thing. So it's kind of setting up the picture of why things happen. Um, but when we get to the actual ones, I'm going to point out some things that I want you, the buzzwords that I want you guys to focus on to distinguish the different types. Um, so evidence of increased red blood cell breakdown. So this is going to be just your labs that you can see increased bilirubin, um, you know, increased lactate dehydrogenase. It's going to release that decreased haptoglobin. So if you see this in your labs, it's just supporting the case of having hemolytic anemia. Um, so that's what that is. Okay, now we're getting into the specifics. Hereditary spherocytosis, it's inherited. It's one of the extra vascular hemolysis um, anemias. So it, essentially you have an intrinsic defect in the red blood cell membrane. So I would highlight that here. So I'm gonna do a lot of annotating. Um, uh, come on. This is what it is. So you have a defect in the red blood cell membrane. Essentially what that means, it's gonna be easy to alter. And that's why you have an issue here because um, it's going to, I'm looking at my first aid because I like the first aid notes better, quite honestly. So you, you have that and then, so less surface area and then they get prematurely removed by the spleen. And so you're decreasing the hemoglobin, um, you're decreasing the oxygen carrying capacity, um, but that's the biggest thing here. And then how are you going to know it's hereditary spherocytosis? So let's, uh, okay, the one thing I don't like about annotating on here is it won't let you go between slides when you do it. The spherocytes. This is a huge, huge, huge thing here. How are you gonna know it's hereditary spherocytosis? You're gonna have spherocytes in the red blood cell. Um, so, because they lyse prematurely when exposed and then um, they can't explain, they can't less space for expansion. So some things here, how will jolly bodies, this is huge right here. If you see how will jolly button, mm, nah. Um, if you have a splenectomy, you will see the how will jolly bodies. My God. <laughs> Um, that's your buzzword. It's cluing you in there because you're going to have the symptoms of anemia. You're going to have spherocytes, which clues you into hereditary spherocytosis. And then, um, if a splenectomy, then you can have those howl jolly bodies, bod bodies. Oh my God. I can't talk. Sorry. Yeah. And then, um, I don't know if it's in here. It's in first aid and it was something that they focused heavily on for us in term five. The increase in fragility, osmotic, increased fragility with the osm osmotic fragility test. So that's something that you can test and kind of confirm that it is hereditary spherocytosis. Because remember, you, you have a defect in the red blood cell membrane. And so... Um, 
if they're exposed to a hypotonic solution, they aren't going to be able to expand. So you're going to have destruction of the red blood cells. So osmotic fragility test, this can clue you in on hereditary spherocytosis. So three things, spherocytes, holly, jolly bodies, and then the osmotic fragility test because um, they cannot withstand um, the hypo, an increasing hypotonic solution. So that's hereditary spherocytosis. Okay, this is just, micro, macro, angiopathic hemolytic anemias. Um, this is just a type of a mechanism of hemolytic anemia right there. Yeah, so red blood cells, the micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia. Do they go into the next one? because there's a point that I wanted to make. Okay, yeah, let's see if they go. Okay, no, apparently. Um, micro um, angiopathic hemolytic anemia, how do you know it's that? Because you were going to see schistocytes, the helmet cells, but they do put that here. Highlight that, star it, underline it, however you like to put it. That's how you're going to know it is a micro, micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia um, because they are damaged when passing through obstructed or narrowed vessels. And that's how you get the schistocyte. So this is your big key in here if you're talking about this. Okay, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Um, so pycogen, the, the big thing here is you're going to see um, the symptoms, it, it's at night. And so you had sudden attacks at night. That's going to be in the stem. This is one of those that thankfully you can narrow down in the stem. This is what it is because it's it's almost like cyclical. You just have episodes of this attack, and so that's going to key you in. So then, you know, what do I need to know about this? Um, yeah. So the pica gene is really important here. So remember that. Uh, actually, I have a question for that previous, for PNH, actually. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking at the regulatory proteins, and we have like CD55 and CD59 as the markers. So on a stem, like on a question, would it be like the RBC is negative for CD55 and CD59? Or would it be yeah. positive? Yeah. So labs will show CD59 and CD55 and 59 negative red blood cells. Okay, perfect. So that will also help you clue in on with the labs. This is what paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria are. I'm pretty sure this one you had to diagnose the patient. A lot of these you have to diagnose the patient. Um, and so labs, um, the time of day or just that it's episodic, that's what you're going to see here. That's how you're going to know it's pH. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, GPD deficiency. This is not the first time you've seen it, thankfully. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, biggest thing here, the G6PD deficiency. So know that enzyme, you've seen it in the past, but don't um, underestimate it here. Um, so highlight it, understand that uh, that's what it is. And then um, we all know the big ones here. So since term one, after an infection, if someone's taking a sulfonamide or ingestion of fava beans, because they love, love, love to focus in on those fava beans. So this is, if you have an attack after one of these, you know it's a G6PD deficiency. Also, if you see the Heinz bodies, this is another thing that's gonna clue you in on what the diagnosis is. And so um, hopefully crossing fingers, this will be an easy one for you to diagnose. Like, again, because this is not the first time you've seen it. So know the characteristics so you can diagnose it. But then also, you know, if um, if they give you the patient presentation, they give you the Heinz body, it's like, what's the deficiency or something like that, or like what likely precipitated it? You know, they loved asking, you know, those types of questions, but um, hopefully G6PD is one of those that will not give you too much um, 
uh, grief on the exam. Okay, so the hemoglobinopathies, I don't remember this being too bad. I don't, I don't remember this being too tricky with the thalassemias and everything. Um, so don't stress yourself out over that. Sometimes when I see a topic, I'm like, oh my God. Um, but I, I don't think it was super, super tricky um, with this, but sickle cell disease. Um, uh, the biggest thing here, so the different alleles. So there's a difference between the trait and then actually having sickle cell anemia. So know, um, know that. And then a big thing is a missense mutation. So let me, okay, so glutamic acid to valine. I don't know if they actually um, focused in on what the what that was, the glutamic acid to valine, but that's what the that's what the um, missense mutation does. So a single amino acid acid substitution. Um, but I don't know if they focus on that in term four. Um, so factors affecting sickling. I I remember this being a thing. So they'll give you the presentation and then like what could have precipitated the attack um, or something like that. So understand those. Um, again, you can see Howell Jolly bodies. Um, they, what was the other one we saw with the Howell Jolly body? Oh, I can't say, <laughs> why can't I say that? Howell Jolly bodies. Um, so if you have the splenectomy and auto splenectomy, you're going to see that. So this is just another one with the Howell Jolly bodies. But instead of seeing, um, seeing the spherocytes, spherocytes, you're going to see the, what, what do they call them? The crew cuts, no, the crescent shaped red blood cells. So um, how jolly body is just, just the autosplenectomy. And then for a sickle cell, you're going to see the, um, the sickled cells. I remember the crises being a huge thing in small group. I don't know if it was a huge thing on the exam. Brady, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, it's a huge thing in real life. Uh, I know that much because that's a big deal. Um, I don't, you know, it's, um, they may even just put in the stem that they come into the ER in this pain crisis, right? These kids, it's actually really sad, but. Um, it just means that those vessels are just occluded, um, a complication of the sickling of those cells. Yeah, in, in small group, I remember I had, I think I had sickle cell and I didn't go into enough detail in like the specific crisis and he got on to me for that. I guess I just have PTSD from that. Like it didn't go into that much detail on the slides, but peripheral smear sickled cells this is the big one because um and then hall how will jolly bodies if you have the autosplenectomy um yeah thalassemias again like i said they didn't get too complicated with these um so the, with the, cause in FTM, it was a big thing, the different, the differences between all of that here, knowing the major defects. So the alpha versus beta globin, um, if there's a, like, because one of them is a synthesis issue and then the other one is um, a like defect issue. I'm on my thing. Yeah, so beta thalassemia, you have decreased globin synthesis. Um, it, or alpha synthesis, yeah, same thing. But again, symptoms of anemia. Okay. 
autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So without a defect extrinsic to red blood cells. Oh, the Coombs test. This is something that they focus on now. It was something in um, CRS too, I believe, with one of the, or a couple of the vasculitides. I think it was the vasculitides. Um, I'm just realizing again, how much I don't like this organization. First aid, not lying, go to first aid. So well organized. <laughs> it made a lot more sense for me. Um, this is just going over that. Okay, so they just want to- Hey, Lindsay, can you yeah. go up real quick? I, I had a trick to remember the, to the warm and cold agglutination because it was a pain for me. Because um, I can, if you go up, I'll show one more, let's see. This one or the- this Yeah, one? yeah, okay. So let me remember how I did this. Um, cold agglutination at, uh, oh, the next one. Okay, wait, no, I'll show the, this one too, right? So you need to know the difference between IG G and which ones are IgM. Cold agglutination means just the, the, the cells bind together at cold temperatures, right? You need to know which ones fall under intravascular and extravascular. But the question is going to ask, if you go to the next slide, it'll ask what was the disease process that could have caused it. I believe the cold agglutination is infectious. That's how I did it. So cold, cold agglutination is stuff like mycoplasma, Epstein-Barr virus, CMV, whereas the warm agglutination tended to be stuff like, you know, lupus and, um, you know, uh, like non-infectious causes. So I just separated them like that to be able to do it. Yeah, that's all. Okay, then megaloblastic, um, B12, folic acid deficiency. Um, so if they come in with a B12 deficiency, you're going to have the neuropathic symptoms. So they're going to have um, almost 100% of the time, paresthesia, so tingling sensation. So if somebody comes up with a tingling sensation or numbness sensation, it's going to be B12 because folic acid deficiency does not have the neuropathic symptoms. So um, make sure you understand that difference right there. Yeah, so... Um, Intrinsic factor is if you if you don't if you have a defect in intrinsic factor or the um, the parietal cells which secrete the intrinsic factor, then you will not get the B twelve um, absorption. So. Findings in megaloblastic. I haven't looked at these slides for so long in the first aid. And so I'm trying to orient myself with what um, I was looking at in first aid. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it, this is all just a lot of fluff and context information, essentially. Yeah, so B12 anemia um, leads you to pernicious anemia. Um, so autoantibodies to the parietal cells, which you don't get an intrinsic factor, you don't get B12 absorption in the terminal ileum. Um, so atrophic gastritis is going to, if they have it, you can clue in on this is, will probably be B12. Um, but, you know, megaloblastic, um, leukopenia, so uh, decreased 
with um, hyper segmented granulocytes, low B12, of course, and then um, homocysteine methyl, methyl malonic <laughs> And I can't say that either. Methylmalonic acid um, is key, key, key with B12 deficiency. Okay, iron deficiency anemia, you have to have to have to know the um, levels for iron deficiency anemia. So many causes, you can have a lack of um, dietary lack of iron, you won't um, impaired absorption or chronic blood loss. This is a microcytic anemia. So the red blood cells are going to be small. So your MCV is going to be lower than normal. Um, the reason being because um, the iron is needed for hemoglobin. So if you're not getting that in there, it's going to be less because the volume is going to be less because you can't have the oxygen binding. Okay. So what is that I'm trying to tell you? So laboratory investigations highlight this slide, this entire slide. You need to know the laboratory investigations. You need to know the levels here. So the big thing you are going to have decreased iron, of course, because it's iron deficiency. You're going to have an increased TIBC. The TIBC is a total iron binding capacity. This is increased. This makes sense because if there's no iron, then the total binding capacity is free. Like all of the binding capacity is free because there's no iron to be had. And so um, it's gonna, you're gonna have an increased TIBC. You're gonna have a decreased ferritin. So this is a very um, important one. And then increased free erythrocyte proto, pro, mm, protoporphyrin. <laughs> um, and then increased uh, RDW, does it say that on this slide? Um, no, but the big thing is um, TIBC, ferritin, and then your iron uh, concent your iron concentration. So those are going to be the big ones here. You will most likely have, they'll give you the patient presentation. You're going to clue in on, oh, that's iron deficiency anemia. And then they're going to have one of those up and down arrow charts, which we all love and adore. And you are going to have to pick which one is representative of the lab values you will see. So make sure you know those. Yeah. Anemia of chronic disease. So, um, so just anemia of inflammation. So anything that's essentially causing any chronic disease leading to inflammation. So this is just anemia of inflammation. So what the inflammation does, you have an increase in hepcidin. And so um, if you have an increase of hepcidin, you don't get iron from the macrophages. So um, the hepcidin's role, it binds ferroportin and um, increase hepcidin. I don't know what, what I just said, but hepcidin binds um, ferroporin on mucosal cells and macrophages and inhibits the trans the transport. So if you can't transport iron from these cells, you don't get iron, a free iron that can bind. So this is often called, um, what, what is it? Something in the face of plenty, like depletion in the face of plenty or something like that. So in your body, you have enough iron, but because you have this increase of hepcidin, you can't transport the iron from inside of those cells to the serum. And so you don't get its effect um, being able to bind and then uh, hemoglobin and then the oxygen carrying capacity. So that's what it is. So inflammation, increased hepcidin, you can't get the iron out of those cells. And so you, you have a decrease in iron um, that can bind and can go out and um, 
fine. So what that means is we're gonna have an increase in ferritin, serum iron reduced, TIBC is decreasing here. So remember in iron, def um, iron deficiency anemia, the TIBC is increased, increased. Here it's decreased. Make that distinction because um, you can compare these two kind of to each other because the labs are a little bit similar, but the big, big thing, the TIBC is decreased, whereas in iron deficiency anemia, it's going to be increased. And then transferrin um, saturation remains almost normal. Um, normocytic, normochromic. Okay, yeah, this is what I just talked about. Um, be able to differentiate these two by their labs. Aplastic anemia. Um, so just chronic primary hematopoietic failure. So you're not getting the red blood cells here. Yeah, failure or destruction of the hematopoietic stem cell cells. So this can be due to a few different things. Um, radiation can cause it, viral agents, um, but at really anything that causes lack of hematopoiesis here, you um, could get an aplastic anemia. Yeah, so marrow, you're uh, you're getting a dry tap here. Okay, those are the anemias. Again, first aid breaks it down really well. Um, the notes, and I actually just realized this scrolling through them, which is probably why I had such a hard time. Um, it go to first aid. Um, it breaks it down really well, and it breaks breaks it down by groups, not just going through um, different ones. But if you are confused on the anemias, because it just kind of goes and goes and goes, make sure that you do go look at first aid because it will definitely help you um, conceptualize it. It did me. Um, so we'll go through the blood cancers real quick. Again. Um, had a hard time with this because I couldn't stop looking. I kept Googling and going to all of my supplemental resources. Like what's the clinical presentation? How do I differentiate? You can't. So you have to go to the labs, the genetics. Um, so just understand that. Okay, so the first one is very introductory. Um, so normal hematopoiesis, you've probably seen this a couple of times. So you have two different stem cell lines, myeloid and then lymphoid progenitor. Um, so we were just talking about the myeloid um, side because we were talking about erythroblasts. Now we're solely in the lymphoid cell line because we're talking about um, all of the um, B cells, T cells at this point. So we've switched here. So just these are definitions for lab values. So increase in the number of white blood cells, leukocytosis versus penio, which is going to be a decrease in the number of white blood cells. Um, again, more just introduction for you. So if you have any defect in this pathway, you can get something wrong, a cancer. So it, and it depends on what part of the pathway here as to what happens um, later. So, you know, you can have an increase in immature, increase in mature, but they don't work properly or um, they might not mature properly. Okay, leukemia versus lymphoma. This is talking about kind of different lines here. So a leukemia, um, I want to get to. So the lymphoma, this is going to be more associated with um, uh, the lymphoid, the lymph, and so, if you see any lymphadenopathy, you're probably gonna have a lymphoma and then a leukemia is more um, gonna be the white blood cells. That's um, a big distinction between that. Okay. 
Okay. So lymphoid neoplasms, um, you can have immature or mature. And this, um, so acute lymphoblastic or leukemia. So acute is, I, is the immature cells versus if you have uh, versus chronic, that's the word I was looking for, acute versus chronic. So acute lymphoblastic um, anemia, leukemia versus chronic lymphoblastic. Acute just refers to the maturity. So immature versus mature cells. That's what it's talking about essentially there. Um, it's, it's, it's not using acute and chronic as terminology for like the duration of the disease. It's the maturity of the cell you're talking about. That's what I was trying to get. Okay, so the pathogenesis, all of this, it's down to the chromosomes, so translocations, um, amplifications, all of these. This is going to be the biggest, biggest, biggest things with lymphomas and leukemias. Um, so each of them is going to have a very specific translocation or overexpression. That is um, going to be something that is going to clue you in on what you're talking about here. That's the biggest, biggest thing. Um, something that's big, these B symptoms, this, it's essentially cancer symptoms. So night sweats, fever, weight loss, all of those things. If you hear someone, a patient saying these things like, oh, malignancy, like that's what's going to clue you in on it. So a lot of these cancers are going to have these B symptoms. So again, you can't really differentiate between them with these symptoms, but this can keep clue you in on, I'm thinking about a malignancy here versus something, you know, like a, an anemia or something like that. So, um, sorry, the, I don't like how this is organized. Um, so lymphomas, again, this is going to be more of a mass versus leukemia, which is blood. Lymphomas are a mass. And so you have Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then Hodgkin's lymphoma versus non-Hodgkin's, it's going to be different um, with, you know, tender and number of lymph nodes that are involved. That's why I stopped there. It's like, um, where are you going with that on that slide? Okay, this is still more of an intro. Um, something else that's gonna be huge, huge, huge shocking about the individual ones are the CD markers, very, very, very big. And um, the lymph lymphomas and leukemias are the CD markers. Okay, so, okay, these are the actual neo, Plasm. Okay, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Acute meaning it's an immature cell lymphoblastic and then leukemia. So it's going to be more of a blood cancer, not a, um, a lymphoid cancer. It's not going to be a tumor or anything like that. Okay, so something big here you will see CD19 positive and CD3 positive. So right off the bat on the first page, you are seeing um, the CD positive cells. Make note of that, that is um, huge. So clinical features, it's gonna be very similar to all of them. Um, so that might not be the biggest thing that clues you in on, but they're cluing in on fever. So you can see a fever and then you can see all the symptoms of a malignancy. Underlying pathology. Okay, so medial sign, mediastinal mass is, is um, a very common one here. Um, also, this is most frequently in kids. I don't know if I pointed that out. I didn't point that out. Kids, this, this is a big, big, big one in children. So if you, if your patient on the vignette is young, you, that can clue you in on um, ALL versus if it's an adult, it's probably not ALL. Um, myeloproxidase negative, Sudan black, um, black B negative. This is, um, uh, 
going to be good on labs. So PAS positive. This is going to be um, a thing there. Star of the slide. This was a thing on our exam. This was 100% a thing on our exam. Know what the favorable and unfavorable um, factors are with ALL. So favorable, it's going to be a little older, low white blood cell count. If it's more B cell hyperploidy, presence of this um, translocation, and then um, it is, it can go into remission. So that's good. So younger or teens adult. So the extreme ages. So remember it all is more children. So the stream extreme ages there. So infancy and then teens, this is, it's bad. If you have a high white blood cell count. If it's more T cell hypoploidy and then presence of 922. So very, 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 very important slide. I can't um, stress that enough. You'll get a couple points on your exam if you memorize this slide. Okay, so chronic lymphocytic leukemia, again, chronic just refers to the maturity of the cells involved. That's all, that's all it means. Um, another name for it is going to be small lymphocytic lymphoma, so SLL. So the, these can be quite interchangeable. Um, I, I think on our exam, they really just used CLL versus SLL, but they're kind of interchangeable. You don't really have to distinguish um, between the two only different than degree of peripheral blood lymphocytosis. Okay. So the flow cytometry, this is a huge, huge thing. So all the CDs here, CD19, 25, 23, this is big here. Yeah. And the, oh, and this. Come on, cooperate with me. Tra it can transform to a more aggressive one. So um, that's a big thing. Burkitt lymphoma. Okay, so lymphoma, so it's going to be um, more of a tumor type uh, cancer, not a blood cancer, because it's going to be a lymphoma. This is under the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma category. And so the, um, the big thing here, it's going to be associated with the C mic. That's huge, 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 huge they will test it. And then um, T814, these are the two that you need to look here. They will 100% test you on this right here. C mic and then um, the T814. That's going to be huge here. How do you tell that it's Burkitt's lymphoma? It's the um, jaw lesion. If you have somebody coming in with a jaw lesion, jaw pain, Burkitt lymphoma. That this, it's one of those things that is specific to Burkitt lymphoma. If you see that in the clinical presentation, you know it's Burkitt lymphoma, and they'll probably ask you which of the following is associated, and it'll be either C my T eight um fourteen, huge, huge, huge there. It's also associated with EBV. This is a huge, huge, huge thing here. So you have a few buzzwords specifically on this page. Um, that you that will clue you in on it. Another thing that I wrote down is CD10 positive. I don't know if that was a huge thing here, but um, EBV, jaw lesion, um, T18, so C mic, and then um, CD10 positive. Yeah, CD19, 2010, and then C mic positive. Okay, follicular lymphoma. This is another non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I don't, when did they talk about Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's? I don't know, but this is another non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's of the B cells. 
This one is a painless waxing and waning lim um, lymphadenopathy. So the uh, it's not going to be painful versus other ones that you will see that. That's follicular. And then it's one is T1418. That's big one. Um, and then BCL2. So those are the things you want to focus on here. 1418, BCL2. And then I don't know if this was here. The only reason I got this right was because I watched the osmosis video. The, um, the histological identification here is clusters of packed follicles with centrocytes. I'll see if that's on a subsequent slide, but I want to put this down here because that's something that we were testing on on our exam and that I got in a um, osmosis video. But um, that's the big thing for follicular is the centrocytes on hist histo. Let me see if it's here and I just didn't. Yeah, centrocytes, here we go. That's the big thing for um, the follicular lymphoma. Diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma, remember that um, CLL can turn into this. That is a huge point that you need to understand. CLL or, C or SLL can turn into D um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, that will probably be on the exam, so make sure you pay attention to that. Um, but there's not a there's not a whole lot here. The big thing is that it can come from CLL. That's the biggest thing that I remember. Um, but BCL2, BCL6 are going to be the big things here. And then your CDs, 19, 20, 10. Marginal zone. Um, so also called a multoma. Know that. And then if translocation is T1118, again, anything that you see a translocation, amplification, you are going to be tested on it. So please make sure that you um, focus in on that. Well, it'll, it'll probably tell you, that's the thing. It'll probably tell you, and that's how you're gonna diagnose the patient. Um, this is associated with H. pylori. So if somebody has an H. pylori infection, they can, it can become a multoma. They have a higher risk of developing a multoma. Okay, so this just broke this down for you, but ALL, CLL, these are leukemias, and then Burkitt's follicular, all the rest of these, these are non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So this isn't necessarily um, in the same category here. So the first two are leukemias, the rest are non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Um, yeah. Hairy cell leukemia, this, is, this one I'm pretty sure was one of the easier ones to diagnose, quite honestly. Um, yeah, this was one of the easier ones to diagnose because the, um, it has very characteristic cells, very characteristic cells. So, okay, BRAF, you need to know that. Um, The what's in red, CD11C and CD103, big. That's a very distinctive one here. So if you have a patient coming in and they have a dry tap and they have the hairy cells, um, it's the cells have filamentous hair-like projections. That's why they're called hairy cells. So yeah, that's what that is. And you have a dry tap and they say, what is a which of the following is the characteristic of this? Uh, the CD, CD11, C, CD103, 100%. But I found this to be one of the easier ones to diagnose because of the dry tap and because of the extensions. But they could also um, talk about the CD11, 103, the dry tap, and say what's characteristic of the cells that you would find. And so you have to describe the cells. So, you know, thread like or blood like extensions, or what would you see on a peripheral um, smear?
Mul I believe this is multiple myeloma, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure there's multiple myeloma. Okay, cool. This one was also quite easy to I um I diagnose because of the punched out lesion on an x-ray. They could give you an x-ray and, and you'll see the punch out lesion or they'll describe the x-ray. What this is going to present as is back pain. So the patient's going to come in, they're going to have kind of malignant symptoms. They're going to come out, you know, low back pain. You're going to see an x-ray and it'll have that punched out lesion. And that's how you're going to know it's multiple myeloma. Um, so other things, hypercalcemia, they'll have anemia. A lot of these are going to have anemia. Um, and then peripheral blood smear with the Rouleau formation, that's going to be big here. So, okay, this is everything I kind of just talked about. So the Rouleau formation, you're going to have these lytic bone lesions at the punched out lesion, hypercalcemia, which goes hand in hand with the lytic lesion, because if you're getting um, bone resorption, then you're going to have hypercalcemia. And then um, you can also see renal insufficiency with this. Um, Ben's Joe, oh, this one, this one too. That's a really big thing. So everything in red on this slide is extremely high yield and will clue you in on this is multiple myeloma. This is what we're talking about. So everything on the slide, I would um, take note of. Um, these two pictures I would make note of as well. Um, so radiographic skull, punched out bone lesions. So, you know, you can see the punched out bone lesions here. And then this cell, of course. Um, so know these two, if you see either of them on the exam, you're gonna say, oh, multiple myeloma. I know what that is. Okay, more lymphomas. This again, um, falls under the category of um, the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Oh, now they talk about Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's. Um, so Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's. The big thing is Hodgkin's is usually a localized single group of nodes, whereas non-Hodgkin's you're gonna have multiple. And so it can be in multiple places. Also, you can have a lot of extra nodal location. That's a big thing with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Big, big thing with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then if you see these Reed Sternberg cells, you are in a Hodgkin's lymphoma, 100%. So this owl eye appearance, please, please, please associate Hodgkin's with Reed Sternberg cells. That's the biggest thing that you are going to see. So you do have classical, um, you have two different types, classical and non-classical. And the difference between the two are going to be the CDs. So classical, you are going to, the Reed Sternberg cells are going to be CD 15 and 30 positive. Um, and the non-classical is going to be CD 15, 30 negative but they're gonna be CD20 and 45 positive. So that's going to be your distinguishing factor versus classical versus non-classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's what I just said. So classical CD15, 30 positive, um, 45 negative, and then non-classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, 15 and 30 negative. I, Brady, did we have to do staging? No, I don't think, I don't think so. Uh -uh. Oh, wait, hold on, go back. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh. 
Okay, this little wrap up right here. Go through the and go through the lecture and do your thing, but this little wrap up is fantastic. This is everything. Yeah. ALL, T lymphocyte lymphoma, CLL, Burkitt follicular, all of this stuff. Ooh, that's fantastic. I would print these three slides off, or I don't know if you have time to print right now, but um, yeah. Pro tip, because <laughs> that really covers all of the really big ones. Okay. Good. Did they, did they? I think that's all like a summary. All of that is just yeah, it's all a summary. summary, but there are a couple that I feel like I didn't see on here. Like, like I don't think it went over like CML or AML. There's another lecture. CML, oh. fall, CML falls under the myelodysplastic stuff. Yeah. Okay, another lecture. Sorry, guys. I saw that wrap up and I was like, oh, that's a cool wrap up. It's done. Like, nope. No, Lindsay. Okay, now we go into the myeloid ones. Um, so acute, again, maturity, myeloid, and then leukemia. So it's the blood. Let's see what on the slide. It has an association with, association with Down syndrome. That's big that they like to associate it with. And then um, Bloom's Fanconi neurofibromatosis. Okay, the biggest thing are these hour rods. If you see hour rods, your AML. So the rods are these little guys right here. So if it describes AML um, and you see the translocation, you see the cells once, you know, it's hour rods. But they'll probably put this in the stem, quite honestly. They'll probably put hour rods in the stem and then you know it's a cute um, myeloid leukemia. And then T1517 is your big one here. That's going to be how you know. Then myeloproliferative, these are going to be your um, Polycytemia vera, central thrombocytopenia, these. And the big thing here are, are these JAK2 mutations. They love to focus on the JAK2 mutations here. All right, now getting into CML. So this is going to be the BCR. BCR ABL, which is the Philadelphia chromosome 922. Yeah. And they just describe it to you here. It's um, T9 colon semicolon 22, and that's the BCR um, ABL translocation. It's the Philadelphia chromosome. That's the big thing there. They love to put, wait, where is that one? Oh, that's the other one. I'll show you, tell you guys that. Yeah, CML, polycytemia vera. So this is just a disorder of the red blood cells. So a big symptom that the points on first aid is it can present with itching after a shower. And so it stimulates that. So this is, uh, you have a decrease of erythropoietin. That's big hair. Yeah. Subnormal serum erythropoietin level. 
Erythropoietin, I'm pretty sure, was a thing on the exam. I don't remember if it was just polycythemia, Vera. Oh, erythropoietin, can, you can give that as a treatment for some anemias. Okay, thrombocytosis, um, increase in quantitative increase in qualitatively abnormal platelets. So you have a lot of abnormal platelets. Um, so deriving from um, neoplastic megakaryocytes. Okay, so I don't remember that being a huge thing. Primary myelofibrosis. None of these are jogging my memory here. So I don't know if they were huge, huge, huge myelofibrosis. Myelodysplastic. So all forms of MDS can transform into AML. So this is a complication. So that I, I would zero in on that being really important. Mm, can you go back to the myelofibrosis? That was that was something that came up that was important. This one? Um, one more up. Yeah, that. Um, so what you see here uh, is you get fibrosis of the um, bone marrow. So what happens is when, if you see that, that little teardrop cell, what happens when the cells try to leave the bone marrow and get into circulation, they're kind of, they have to get through the fibrotic bone. Um, so they get into this teardrop, they're like pulled out. So you, they get into this teardrop shape. So if you, and you see any of the teardrop cells or the, uh, they're called dactrocytes, that, that means like usually they have to be pinched out of some sort of tight opening. So it's either there or in the spleen, but yeah, that was the only thing for that. Okay, so now we're just summarizing. Memorize this, this needs to be your best friend. Important translocations, they will test you on every single one of them. Every single one of them. I would bet money if I had money, but I don't, but you will be tested on every single one of these translocations. <laughs> so know them, please. All right. Okay, that's blood. Um, I cannot stress this enough, guys. Please use first aid for this. I wish I hadn't used first aid when I was going through this in term four. I, it would have made my life so much easier. Um, because like I said, when I was scrolling through it, it wasn't organizing things the way I thought it should be organized, which is so please use first aid. Please, pretty please with sugar on top. It will help you so much. Uh, what about the infections, the blood and lymphatic infections? Oh, yeah, we can go through yeah. that. Yeah, it's mostly self-explanatory, like just knowing the bugs and uh, how they present. But then yeah, was... if you want to do... Yeah, I... Do... I... Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you want to do that real quick, then I'll do quickly do the chemo stuff, uh, then we'll be good. Yeah, I need to bring it up. Hold on, because I didn't open up those slides. So give me a sec. Um, but can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, can you so, do you mind explaining why we see HbA2 in thalassemia uh, minor but not major? HBH? HbA2. Oh, hemoglobin A. Yeah. That's for alpha Oh, so um, it says on that table that you see um, that you see HBA two in minor but not major. I think it's flip. So I think uh, so. You do everybody. I believe gets a little bit of A two. It's just like a like a byproduct, not a byproduct, but just a different configuration of hemoglobin. I think with minor, you're 
pretty much I'll, I'll have to let me let me double check while Lindsay's doing it I think with minor you're pretty much the same but with major you have a huge increase in a2 because you can't make the normal a but I'll look into it real quick okay so the slide it's a uh, lecture rdc2 and it's slide okay. 32 and they show that ab hba2 is high in uh, in beta thalassemia minor minor okay Very it should be made in, uh, or they don't say actually anything about hba2 and major I'm not okay see i'll take a look at it real quick and i'll let you okay. know okay perfect okay thanks there are just two of these, right? Two of the blood and lymphoma, but no. Yes. Why can't I talk? Blood and lymphatic. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so there were just a handful of questions. Don't go crazy on these. And they did not try to confuse you either. So what you see is what you get, essentially. Um, it's not going, there are some things that clue you in on, um, but it's not going to be um, crazy confusing on these. Okay, so why pestis? Whenever they give you these life cycles, just focus in on like the infectious form and how it infects. They're not going to go through this entire thing. But why pestis? Um, Bubos, this is the big thing here. You're going to see this. This is the clinical presentation. It's like, oh, that's why pestis. Um, so abrupt onset fever. So patient presents with abrupt onset fever and chills on exam. You see um, these Bubos. Um, you know, which of the following is a risk for this or which of the following would so flea bite um something along those lines okay. so nothing on here looks different than any other um respiratory um manifestation that you would see. Yeah, they're, they're really gonna focus on this kind of stuff. Yeah, these lesions right here, the again green, that's why they called it the black death because you know, why pestis was, it wasn't, yeah, the septicemia plague. So all of this is just different presentations. Bubonic plague, pneumonic plague, septicemic plague, um, it's all gonna boil down to white pestis, essentially. I, I don't remember them distinguishing between the different plagues, just knowing the symptoms of each and then what's the causative agent, white pestis. Um, that's the big thing here. So with, with the different ones, just know what the primary symptoms are and then narrow it down. Oh, it's white pestis. Um, F1, I remember this being a thing for Y pestis. That's big here. So all of these are virulence. You know, they love virulence factors. Why is this so dangerous? Um, so F1 envelope antigen, um, then you have the V antigen and then this, but F1, I feel like was the biggest one they liked to um, focus in on there. So needle aspirate of the bubos, um, Blood auger, chocolate auger, or McConkey's F1. So yeah, this is probably why F1 was sticking out on that slide for me because serology titers against the F1 antigen. I think that's a big thing here. Um, I also remember in term four, I think they liked to ask a handful of times about control, like prevention and control, but it, it, it was very simple. It was very surface level is, you know, how can you prevent this in the future? It's like, in fact, um, a population control of whatever it was. Okay, Bartonella, gram neg, microaerophilic. Okay, there is a difference between these. So um, I, I do remember this being a thing. You really do need to narrow down the different so cat stretch 
carry-ons and then trench and know that it's Tensley, Bacilliformis and Quintana, you do need to know those differences because they'll ask you maybe like one question over Bartonella species, but they're going to ask you Bartonella Hensley versus Bacilliformis versus Quintana. Um, but it, it's very clear that there's a difference. So cat scratch transmitted by fleas, but um, following a flea bite or a cat scratch. Um, so you have the erythematous pustule. Um, so domestic reservoir is the cat. Yeah, so Hensley, cat, strat, cat scratch. Um, yeah, and then Quintana, trench fever, transmitted by body, body louse. Highlight that transmit is transmitted by the body louse primary association culture negative endocarditis. Okay, and then bacillary angiomatosis. So this is just a symptom that can be of both Hensley and Quintana. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, sorry to interrupt. For the B. Quintana, for example, do we need to know the, the name of the body louse or body louse is enough? Not just in this, but like the flies or ticks. Yeah, that name. Yes. I really don't remember that being a thing. Brady, do you yeah, remember I, that being? I do not. I've never read that ever. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> don't worry about that one. But like the flies for like malaria are important because it or yeah. like all the, that. Well, you know what I mean? Like the different, we'll go through that in a second. But like, yeah, yeah, that's some of the more important ones like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or like stuff like that are important. But these, no, not these. Yeah. And then Bacilliformis is the sand fly. Um, so this is different than the body louse previously. One of these... Is one of these associated with um, um, homeless populations? I remember that being a thing on one of these. Maybe, maybe not the, the disease. Yeah. Yes, the patient will come in and they are homeless, and that's going to clue you in on that's what this is. So that is a thing. So make note of that. The um, epidemiology. It's and like the a, is, yeah. It's, I think it's because like the low poor, like sorry, the poor hygiene. So I think mm -hmm. of like the people in the trenches, like poor hygiene and homeless poor hygiene. So. Yeah. So the so the vignette will most likely say that the patient was found homeless and they're coming into the ED or they're brought into the ED and they have these symptoms. But simply because the the patient is homeless, you can zero in on it because they are at an increased risk of it. So make that note. I will hemorrhage. Fever. Okay, filoviruses. Anytime they tell you enveloped negative sense RNA, something like that, they probably want you to know it. Um, that was probably for this exam. I underestimated it on this exam um, because this is the first time I noticed it because FTCM was FTCM and then I was sick for CRS. I woke up throwing up that morning and so I had to take the completion. So RHS was the first exam that I took where I, they delved in really deep with the micro and stuff and I underestimated what they were going to ask. And so the big thing here, please don't do what I did. I could diagnose all of the micro, but then it would ask, what is a characteristic feature of the causative organism? And I can't even tell you how many questions asked just positive, negative sense RNA, you know, single strand, positive sense RNA, gram negative, whatever. So please, 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 if you have not already done that, don't do what I did and underestimate that because I knew the presentations, I knew the causative agent, but then I didn't memorize that the causative agent um, was gram whatever, or, you know, optogen sensitive or maltose, um, firm, like I didn't memorize because it wasn't in my head, the biggest thing. Don't do what I did. Go through, spend a few hours memorizing all that stuff. You'll get a lot of points on the exam. Okay. 
Ebola. What do you need to know for this? This, um, you're gonna probably be able to recognize very quickly because it, it yeah, the diarrhea and vomiting is huge. Fun fact, I worked at the hospital, um, not during it because the Ebola was a few years ago, but the outbreak in Dallas, um, I worked at the hospital that had the case, identified that first case. And I actually worked with the doctor too. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully this one will be a little easier to diagnose because the symptomatology is very characteristic of it. Okay. Filiariasis, I can't say, filiariasis. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, so transmitted by the black flies, I, again, I don't really think the actual name of it was a huge thing. Um, okay, so three types. Yes, you need to know the types. I remember this being a thing. Um, so mosquito, L3, filial larvae. Okay, this will be a huge thing, being able to tell that your patient has filariasis, the lymphatic um, symptoms from it. So that can clue you in on it. Oh, this was one, the exoides. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is a thing. Or maybe I've just heard it enough times that it's like clicking for me. Um, but I don't, I think they actually used th this species, the I, soides. I think it has something to do with Rocky Mountain spotted fever or uh, Lyme disease, one of those two. That's probably where yeah. you heard it from. Okay, yeah. And life cycle, focus on the infective form. You don't like read through this, um, focus on just the infective form and then the diagnostic stage because that's what's clinically relevant for you. Um, so risk factors, it's important anytime there's a risk factor and then complications again. Okay, so pear-shaped, um, the merozoites appear as elliptical pear-shaped forms. That's gonna clue you in on if they talk about it in the vignette. Okay, malaria, this does get very specific. Um, you do need to know the different ones. So plasmodium, non-modal protozoal parasites. Um, The Anopheles, female Anopheles, specifically the female Anopheles mosquito, you do need to know that. So um, four species, yes, you need to know oval versus vivax versus malaria, falciparum. Um, they are all transmitted by the female Anopheles, but you do need to know the different species because it's going to be a little different. Again, life cycle, um, just focus on infective diagnostic forms. You don't have to go too crazy with all of this. Um, oh, wow, that's a lot of words. <laughs> but just, I, I'm not gonna read this at you and I'm not gonna sit here while you stare at me and I read through this, but again, focus on the infectious and diagnostic forms. That's gonna be the big, biggest, biggest, biggest thing. 
Um, and then of course the different ones are going to be important versus so bivax, ovale, um, pay attention to the differences between those. So the manifestations, flu-like symptoms, it, that's really gonna be across the board. Um, clinical disease, There was, yes, this is big um, because there's a difference between Vivax and Ovale versus um, malaria. There's a difference. You need to know the difference between these two. So um, Vivax is most prevalent, capable because of, okay, so because of the cyclic fever um, brings paroxysms every 48 hours. That is a very important distinction there. Um, can re, okay, so ovale infection immature, both of these are immature, relapse from a hypnozoite form. Uh, but this one, okay, so this is mature versus immature here. So notice that both Vivax and ovale and are infecting the immature red blood cells versus malaria, which is infecting the mature red blood cells. Um, in, unable to relapse after eradication. So no hypno So um, it causes a quartan malaria. So 72 hour cycles versus up here, you saw 48 hour cycles. This one is a 72 hour cycle. It's a very important um, um, distinction. And then falciparum, still it's different. Um, so this can infect any stage of the development of the red blood cell carries high risk of mortality, daily cycles. So this is daily cycles of fever, sweating, shaking, chills, known as um, quotidian malaria, just not form. So there is a very big difference between the different um, causative agents of malaria. Know these three slides um, very, very well. It's a blockage of kidney flow. Okay. So black water fever, characterized by darkened urine. Um, so darkened urine might be one of those things that they clue in on in the vignette. So know that. Um, so we are here to tell you, this is very important, the differences between the three. So you'll know it's malaria. They'll diagnose them in the vignette with malaria, but then based off of the presentation, you're going to need to figure out which species it's talking about. They're also going to have a travel history. It's very important in the clinical presentation. It's just how to do it. Hey, Lindsay, to let them know, those pictures right there are important. Like we had to differentiate these. Uh, like they gave you a couple of some of the ones that were more specific. Yeah, uh, I, I do. There, see, there are some things that are very characteristic of. See, like the falciform, the one, the third one has like those rings. Like that was characteristic. Yeah. Oh, yes, I remember this. Yeah, so I think, yeah, and he told us in lecture that that was fair game, these pictures. So find the ones that are very unique to that specific uh, strain. Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, and something, sickle cell disease, you're resistant to malaria. That's something that, um, that might have, I might have asked that, like which of the following is a protective factor against malaria? Or they'll describe a person with sickle cell disease. It's like, which of the following is this person resistant against or something along those lines? Oh, and prevention, this is, I, I think this was something, um, like, or maybe I'm making this up because I like malaria prevention, it's the mosquitoes. And so I know that people will do mosquito nets. Maybe I'm making that up as a question, 
I remember that somewhere. Uh, I, I remember it too. It was just, it seemed like a silly question. They were like, what's the best prevention for malaria? And the answer was like mosquito nets. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I do remember that from the exam or an exam at some point. <laughs> okay. So that's that. Like I said, there, it's not going to get too complicated with it. You, um, each one of those has something very specific for it. Um, take advantage of that because not all of these things are going to be as um, easy to clue in on with buzzwords. So, but the blood and lymph infections are one of those things. So get your points <laughs> essentially is what I'm saying there. All right, uh, let's do five minutes and then I'll finish the last couple of farm lectures. Um, it won't take too long, but um, take a five minute break. All right, um, let's, uh, let's get this done. We'll do it quickly. The reason, um, I'm just gonna show y'all some things. Okay, first off, I found this. Um, so for beta thalassemia, you can see, so it's heterozygous. So you are, you are making beta chains. They're just not a lot of them. So to compensate the body makes, uh, increases the, the, uh, alpha two or HBA two, uh, variant, right? So just to get oxygenation to the body, the problem. So you do get an increase, a slight increase, about three and a half percent increase of a two, uh, but for, uh, thalassemia major, you have no beta chain. So like what, for the baby to survive, you have to make these altered variants. So it's going to have an increase in fetal hemoglobin HBF, and it's also going to have a drastic increase in alpha two. Okay. So this is on page, um, 428 of, um, of 21, first day 21. So yeah, so you see a little bit increase in minor, but um, uh, a massive increase in uh, major plus that fetal hemoglobin. All right, so um, here's the thing. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, Dr. Das, because these, these lectures can become daunting, um, Dr. Dasso's lectures uh, or, or his questions are very similar to the IMCQ questions. Um, you need to know side effects of the drugs um, and you need to know if there is a side effect, how do you treat that? Okay, so a second, third order questions, um, but we'll quickly go through them. So the first one is just basic introduction to the actual drugs um, and how they work. I don't think a lot of um, questions came from that. They were specific to the drugs. So the first one um, at the end started talking about the anti-metabolites. So anything that's going to affect folate, purines, or pyrimidines, you're not going to make DNA, right? You're, you're halting the DNA production here. That's the whole uh, idea with these anti-metabolites. So you've seen these before in FTM, uh, things like methotrexate, um, that right. So it is uh, related to folate, but it is going to stop that process. Um, this is a key enzyme to know. You should, I mean, if you uh, recall it from FTM, this dihydrofolate reductase. But um, as for like diving too deep into this, not really, right? But what's a big thing? You never want to give this to a uh, pregnant woman, right? Um, you could decrease your folate or it's substituting for folate. So you can get folate deficiencies and stuff like that. Um, so methotrexate, but like I said, these are some of the side effects uh, that you need to be aware of, hepatic fibrosis and cirrhosis, pneumonitis. Okay, mostly that it's hepatotoxic, right? Um, um, okay, and here's another thing, right? So what do you do? So you, you have to be able to supplement uh, this folate uh, for these people, like you can't just halt, uh, halt synthesis. So what they do is you block the metabolism of folate here, but you can also come downstream on that pathway and give uh, levocorin and it'll help to make the, the product. So it's kind of like um, you completely stopped it here and you're substituting it like subpar, but allowing it for, for, for normal growth to occur. So um, that would be fair game to know that as well. Okay. So um, that's good. Um, so we'll go through a couple of the other ones. These also fall, fall into these purine analogs, hypoxanthine, uh, that salvage pathway. Uh, you'll remember HGPRT, which is syndrome, that, um, what was it called? Uh, Self-mutilating behavior. Um, so let's see, um, right. Uh, xanthine oxidase, enzyme you wanna remember. And again, you're preventing this breakdown. 
All right. Again, hepatotoxic. A lot of these drugs, unfortunately, are hepatotoxic and can cause bone marrow suppression. Uh, I don't know that this was a big one, um, but it's, I guess it's fair game. It came up, but it's pretty much the same as mercaptopurine. Um, oh, yeah, this was that weird thing that happens. I think there was a DLA way back about it, this TMPT mutation. So, like, if you give it to somebody that has this mutation, they get, like, uh, an obscene amount of myelosuppression, like deadly myelosuppression. So they have, the, yeah, this is it. Um, so you can see this is normal. And this is if they have uh, the disease variant, um, they get uh, major um, adverse effects to it. So you need to be aware of that, this um, methyltransferase uh, mutation. All right, and then the pyrimidines, y'all are probably familiar. I'll remember 5-FU, 5-fluorouracine, maybe not this one, but um, again, enzyme thymidylate synthase. And as Lindsay stated for the other stuff, first aid is great for this too. You can go through the biochem section and find this stuff. Um, and again, same process. We're stopping the formation of nucleotides. And if that's the process, we can halt uh, DNA replication in this, um, in this tropic environment. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, now honestly, like when it comes to like him being like, or the, the question being like, this patient has colorectal cancer, what do you want to give them? And you happen to like choose like, well, I'd give them five floor years. So like it, it wasn't anything like that. It was literally like, uh, this patient has some sort of lung cancer. They are on like this eight drug regimen. And then they'd be like, they got hepatotoxicity. What was the drug that caused it? Like, it was like that. So you, you don't have to actually like know how to treat these cancers. Cause when it comes down to it, they usually give, um, uh, a cra you know, like it's just a crazy combination of, of, of drugs that go into it. Um, I don't remember that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So some other ones, Intercalating agents, that just means it binds to the middle of it and prevents it from, uh, 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 it causes strand breakage, um, interfere with replication. All right, so doxyrubicin, Donna Rubinson. Uh, man, I think first aid, because I guess we covered it later. There was like this picture of a man, but it was like with the letters. Y'all could tell me if y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's like, like at the very end of these slides, Brady. Okay, but okay. Yeah, yeah. So like first aid picture, that's all you need. Yeah, yeah, right. And like, seriously, like the D was over the heart. So you know that these, I still, I mean, remember it to this day, like the D's are to the, over the heart. So it's, it causes cardiotoxicity. The B's are over the lungs. So like bleomycin causes pulmonary issues, pulmonary fibrosis and stuff. Uh, we could double check it here, but um, uh, those are the big things there. So um, yeah, so inhibit, inhibition of topoisomerase too. Uh, that's a big thing there. It intercalates in the DNA. Um, yeah, oh, see, so it's cardiotoxic. So that would be the big thing there. Um, let's see, pulmonary toxicity. See, the bees were over the lungs. That's what it causes, this pulmonary fibrosis as well. Alkylating agents, um, okay, so uh, transfers these alkyl groups, the cytotoxic effect. Um, right, so cyclophosphamide is the big one. Um, Oh, just so y'all know, while Lindsay was talking, I uploaded all of these notes of my notes, my highlighted notes to my drive. Also, it's probably helpful. I, I, if you want to look at, like I did for you last time, my annotate, my uh, exam notes that I write out, uh, it's all shorthand, but I posted that too, if y'all want to take a look at that. Um, it's all just abbreviated notes that I felt was important for the, for the exam. All right. Um, Right. So if y'all go through my stuff, I, obviously the stuff that's in red was kind of the stuff that I thought was super important. Green's a little bit less, yellow's just kind of extra material. So here's a big one. Cyclophosphamide causes hemorrhagic cystitis. So in that case, um, you give mesna for it. Uh, that is, so like, that would be a great question. Patient comes in, um, you give them cyclophosphamide and then they won't, and they'll be like, they had some sort of complication. You would determine it was hemorrhagic cystitis and you would give them MESNA for that complication, right? Similar to his IMCQs. Um, yeah, and then ifophosphamide was similar. Oh, it's an analog to, there was a little bit something different, I can't remember. Oh, neurological toxicity as well, okay. So again, this is like a common theme. This is what you should be focusing on. Um, yeah, I don't think these were super important either. Busulfan, again, B, B was over the lungs, so pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, 
cisplatin was over the bladder, I believe, or something like that. Oh, the ears. Yeah, the C's made the ears. So cisplatin was ototoxic, and I think over the kidneys as well. So nephrotoxic as well. <clears throat> so again, you could ask a question. Somebody was in renal failure. You want to avoid using something like this because it's nephrotoxic, and they're already um, uh, susceptible or like fair game. Like this would be a great, great question too. Uh, amifostine, they could give that. It's uh, uh, protective to the renal system. Okay, so so that's that's another thing he likes to. Uh, focus on, or a big thing he likes to focus on. <clears throat> All right, so the microtubules, you're either going to um, prevent their formation or prevent their breakdown, right? That's the whole idea here. Um, let's see. Okay, so yeah, the V's for bin blasting were like the, the, um, the hands and the feet of this little man. So it's, uh, it causes peripheral neuropathy, right? So that's a good way to remember that. Paclitaxel. Okay, so the, mm, these prevent, these prevent formation or polymerization of the, if it's polymerization, yeah, prevents them from forming. And then the taxols, uh, paclitaxel, promote formation. So it, it keeps them together, prevents them from breaking down. So that's a good differential, differential there. Um, let's see. The toposide, remember two, this was the one that was similar to some of the bacterial drugs they used for topo two, but etoposide sounds like etoposide. So it inhibits topoisomerase two. So that, um, that unwinding effect or that um, hyper, you know what I mean? The, um, the positive and negative supercoiling effect. So you can break that down or um, prevent that or, or prevent that from working. So you get the supercoil, so it breaks the, the DNA down. All right, and then these will do, uh, the campothasins will do TOFO1. Then you know about glucocorticoids. In general, the idea of glucocorticoids is they're in immunosuppressant. So prednisone is given. Just remember, you don't wanna keep patients on this for too long because you could get adrenal atrophy if you don't have an endogenous um, uh, cortisol being made. All right, estrogen inhibitors, these are important and I'll, I'll, I'll break these down because, um, so tamoxifen is for breast cancer, um, it is an antagonist at the breast. Now, the problem with that is it's an, also an agonist on the uterus and an agonist on the bone. It's great, fine that it's an agonist on the bone, but the fact that it's an agonist at the uterus can, in, can cause uterine cancer. So what's the answer to that? Well, they made raloxifen, which is an antagonist on the breast, great, an antagonist on the uterus, which is great, but it is an agonist on the bone. So it's kind of a perfect situation because you want that agonist on the bone to prevent osteoporosis, but you don't want any extra estrogen sensitive uh, tumor formation in the breast or subsequently in the uterus, okay? So you need to keep those separate in your mind. I think uh, raloxifen is a better version of tamoxifen because it has that an antagonist effect on um, on the uterine tissue or uterine receptors, uterine estrogen receptors. What is this? Oh, this is like a full-blown antagonist, this fulvestrin. I forget what they use this for. I guess just metastatic breast cancer. Um, I, yeah, increases degradation. Okay, so just in principle, that, would, that could lead to osteoporosis if that's the case. Um, Hormone receptor positive and postmenopausal women. Okay. Oh, you know what this is? They use this in refractory cases. So you use something else, and this is like full blown. Like if, if it's just not working, or if the tumor's too aggressive, they can go forth and, and try to use this. And um, obviously, the side effects are you know the stronger the drug, the more side effects. All right. Aromatase inhibitors. Uh, aromatase is the enzyme that takes testosterone and converts it to estrogen. So for these estrogen positive breast cancers or estrogen positive cancers in general, endometrial cancers and whatnot, if you can prevent the formation of estrogen, um, you know, that's a good thing. All right. So these will be there, a little difference there, reversible versus irreversible. Then androgen inhibitors. So this is for more for like testicular cancers and stuff like that. Um, the interesting thing, if you remember, GnRH coming from the hypothalamus signals LH and FSH in the pituitary to, um, to signal the androgens, testosterone, estrogen, and whatnot. But remember, GnRH 
uh, is released in a pulsatile fashion. Okay, so what these drugs actually do is it's a constant release of gene uh, of um, uh, it. it it's a constant release of, so if there are analogs of GNRH, it causes a constant release. So what you actually see is a rich, right when you give it, you give this agonist effect. So you'll get increased androgens just briefly. And then the body realizes that it's not pulsatile, right? It's just like this increase and it's just this constant, right? So as soon as the body recognizes that it's not in this pulsatile fashion, you get a decreased response to it. So um, fair game, we had a question on it. Uh, on our recent exam, uh, talking about this, uh, the way this works. So the idea is that you would expect the body to release it pulsatile, so it works properly. This is given as you know as um, um, a constant dose. So what happens is you get this in initial agonist effect, and then the body realizes it's not pulsatile, and then you get this drop off. So you'll get decreased testosterone after that. Let's see. Oh, and if you get what is this flare? Oh, oh, sorry. So, right. So in this initial, in this initial upstroke, um, you can give flutamide, right. Until the body realizes that we need to, that it's going to decrease, that it's not pulsatile. You can give flutamide to, to counteract that initial upstroke. Yeah. See, right. So you give GNRH and it, it assumes it's just normal pulsatile and um, you get this spike, but then you realize, oh, it's not pulsatile. It's constant. So all of a sudden you get this drop off in response to it. Okay. So give flutamide during the spike this initial spike. And then after that, it should be good. All right, agonist, um, right? So you can give this for treatment of endometriosis. Um, and then, uh, right, okay, yeah. Endometriosis, again, is estrogen sensitive. So if you give this agonist, after that upstroke, you're down, uh, you go down, so you'll get decreased estrogen, decreased androgens in general. So it'll help with um, this estrogen sensitive endometriosis, and then flutamide being that androgen receptor blocker will help with that initial spike. All right, signal transduction, you know, tyrosine kinase, um, by now uh, all about insulin and stuff. Um, yeah, so um, uh, yeah, a lot of tumors, some of those translocations uh, tonically activate tyrosine kinases. So if that's the case, um, you know, you can activate a lot of things, not only insulin, but, you know, a whole, uh, anything that's got a tyrosine kinase receptor. Um, I did put a star on this. I don't know if it's super high yield, you may get one question from it, but it kind of just tells you what goes with what. Okay, so you can give a mantinib. That's actually a big one. Um, that's first line. You can see this tyrosine kinase. So what actually happens with these translocations, like you originally had a stop sign next to this tyrosine kinase, okay? But it got translocated. So instead of putting a stop sign, now you put a green light right in front of this tyrosine kinase. That's what happens when it's translocated. You took the stop sign off and you put a green light in front of it. Like it happened by accident, but it did happen, right? So now you have a green light on this tyrosine kinase. So it's just gonna just activate everything, right? So when you talk about this BCR able, which one is that? Um, that's the Philadelphia chromosome. So CLL, wait, is that right? No. Which one is? CML. CML. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So uh, you can give a mantin if that's the first line treatment for that. Um, okay. Anything, uh, I don't know if y'all know by now, if it has a MAB in it, that means monoclonal antibody. Okay. So any of these monoclonal antibodies can do, can work there. Um, and you can see kind of how they work here. And it's some miscellaneous ones. I don't know how high yield this stuff is. Um, so that hydroxyurea is fairly common, but didn't we talk about this in the beginning? Yeah, ribonucleotide reductase, or maybe we didn't, but that's a common one we talked about in FTM, uh, kill cell in that S phase. Interferon, uh, interferon alpha here. Yeah, so for hairy cell leukemia, CML, malignant pneumonia, uh, a melanoma, stuff like that. Obviously, interferon is a, a potent activator in um, the immune system, so it'll help to to fight stuff off. All right. Now, again, I don't remember too many things. It, it wasn't it wasn't super specific, but some of these should be straightforward, like prostate cancer. Yeah, you're going to have increased testosterone. So give one of those uh, GNRH agonists. And for that initial upstroke, get flutamide. Breast cancer, you should know which ones you want to use. Probably start out with tamoxifen um, and then, you know, uh, go from there and see how it goes. So um, that's pretty much it. And then the last one, um, we have, uh, so 
I think um, Dr. Gatos's lectures are really dense, but they're really explanatory. So it is kind of self-explanatory here, um, what's going on. You need to know the different, as Lindsay was going through, the different uh, cycles, right? You get these the cyclical fevers, right? The, the, the more, like um, the, the sooner, the, the, the smaller the window, meaning that falciform, uh, malaria is in 24 hour cycles. That means it's worse. That's the worst one. Whereas the other one's 48, the last one's 72. So the, the narrower the window, uh, the worse it tends to be. So you can actually affect these, um, the, the, the mosquito or the life cycle of the mosquito at different points. Typically they work uh, on the blood, right? Um, but you can actually affect the merozoites and the liver as well. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, primaquin, that's a big one. Um, if, if he ever, I, I love that he puts his own little uh, mnemonics and like he's his, his own little first aid system going. Um, if that's there, um, you know, that's definitely something you wanna write down. Um, let's see, but again, you wanna know the side effects of these. You wanna know when you could give it to a pregnant woman or not because malaria can be transmitted. Uh, so that's important. Um, and you, what I say, side effects. And then at the end, uh, we'll look at some of the drug, the, the regimens that go through, but see, this is a good example, even though it's such a good drug to use here, you have to avoid uh, in pregnancy. And we talk about primaquine, that's one of the examples they use for G6PD deficiency, right? If you put them into that, that stress, you get uh, hemolysis. All right, and again, not advised in pregnant woman, right? So like, this is a great little way to, to figure it out. These are all the blood, uh, these attack the blood schizons or skin of whatever that is, right? And you can see these are folate synthesis inhibitors, so it'll uh, prevent the DNA from being, um, um, you, the cycle to be uh, overactivated. Right, and you can see here, uh, they use these in combination. So in the folate synthesis pathway, uh, you can give uh, some phonopmides and you can give one of these as well, and you attack it at two different steps, right? But again, obviously, if you're blocking folate synthesis, you, you can't give it to a pregnant woman. Very important, these dermatologic reactions, because it's not just, you know, this is mild, but this is very serious. You, I'm sure you've come across a lot of drugs that ca cause this. Uh, a TEN is like an advanced version of Stephen Johnson's, but um, you need to be aware of what causes those. All right, and then you can give doxycycline as uh, antibiotic. Uh, but you can give it in, um, uh, you, you can also give it here for this protein synthesis inhibitor. Um, patients seem to be photosensitive. Um, so again, yeah, no pregnancy, no children under eight. Doxycycline is a tetracycline, it falls under that class. And the reason actually, uh, it causes tendon rupture. I don't know why, but it does. So you don't wanna give it to young children um, for that reason or any tetracyclines, all right? Let's see, um, so this is good. This is one that's good for pregnant women as prophylaxis. Melofloquine, I think that may be the only one that causes neuropsychiatric symptoms. So, um, you know, if you have a psychiatric patient, obviously you don't wanna exacerbate that. Or if they give you a patient that's on this and they get, uh, or, or they give you a patient that is on new medication uh, for this and they have neuropsychiatric symptoms, uh, you should think of melofloquine. Mefloquine. All right, do not co-administer. Okay, there we go. Right, so again, just a just a one or two line thing for each of these, when to give it, what's the react, you know, what does it actually do? What are the side effects, okay? Or maybe even what combinations you would give it with like those full weight synthesis inhibitors. Chloroquine is pretty common. Um, so it's a drug of choice for the non uh, falciparum forms and, um, yeah, um, and this is a good one. I think I think this they don't know for sure how this works, or they just figured it out. They use they use this forever, and they didn't know how it worked. And then it concentrates in the then the uh, food vacuoles, and it helps to break down. Okay, so um, toxicity to the buildup of heme. Yeah, and you could see that here. So again, you, at this point, you like you can look at these slides. Um, you know, intelligently. And like, if he went through the process of making this beautiful slide, like maybe it's important to know how chloroquine works. You know, like that's kind of my thought process when I go through these. Um, yeah, I don't, I would, I don't know what, 
I feel like this came up at some point. Yeah, maybe just make note of that. Again, hemolysis, G6PD. Um, yeah, and then again, so psoriasis and porphyr porphyras, um, porphyrias, um, right? So, but, and you can get uh, vision problems, retinal or visual abnormalities, chloroquine. And then there's quinine and quinidine, um, first line for this severe falciparum disease, falciparum disease. Um, yeah, so you can give that and it's an intercalating agent. Okay, so um, this is very important. I think he had a, there it is. Yeah, for sure know this. These, uh, so first line drug, even though it has so many toxicities, okay? So by all means, this came up. You definitely need to know these uh, side effects, okay? Queen, butch queen, queen butch or whatever. Um, whatever works, just know it. All right. And then, right, so you can see this, you can affect it here, these gametocytes, um, right? Wait, primaquine, sorry. Primaquine is gonna be the one that you wanna, uh, it's gonna be a, a gametocyte site agent. All right, and then what's really good is he did go through this summary at the end. Um, so it's good to make sure you kind of, you don't need to know all of this, like all of these things, but just know the first line drug to pregnancy, what's safe in pregnancy and stuff like that. The stuff down here that he summarizes, make sure you know that, um, right? Pregnancy, of course, right? And this is good, chemo prophylaxis. This is what you go, if we were to go um, in an endemic area, right? We would wanna get um, prophylaxis for it, right? And that's what they do. All right, well, that is all we have. Um, good luck on your exam. If you're on the island, we'll go out Monday night, maybe go to lab or whatever, the brewery. Y'all are awesome, do well. Let us know if y'all need anything. Yeah, good luck. Uh, yeah, good luck. Look at first aid. <laughs> Always. <laughs>